the performer that we would be following in this session today is first we will have an overview of the SARPC Act, and then we would see the interplay between the SARPC and the IPC. We may also take the reference of the recent judgments uh, by the NCLT, NCLAT, or the Supreme Court, which has come um, in a recent in recent time. So uh, to start with, SARPC Act is obviously Act of 2002, which is there in existence before the IBC. So when SARPC is already there and was already there, what was the need to bring IBC? And before that, before SARPC, there was another Act of Recovery of Debt for, for the banks and financial institutions. When there was RDD BFI Act, why there was need to bring the SARPC? So just a brief introduction, the Recovery of Debt Act was the act where the banks or the financial institutions has to apply to the tribunals and seek for the adjudication. But it was, uh, there were two committees which were formed. One of them was the Narsima Committee and it was found that the NPA of the banks are increasing and the RDDB Act is not sufficient to have or to get the recovery to the banks or the financial institutions in a, a speedier manner. SARPC Act was introduced where the banks can enforce their security interest without intervention of the court. The subject, the, the statement of object given for the act is very, very important. The core part of that statement of object is this, that here the banks and the financial institutions are having power to enforce their security interest without intervention of the court. Now, if, if you are not inviting intervention of the court, then you can run your process to enforce your security interest in the manner that you wish obviously in the manner which is subject to the provisions of the SARPC Act, which we'll be going through. Now, I would say SARPC is providing the provisions, taking the basis which you can recover your security interest, you can enforce security interest and recover the debt which has come to be default. But there are always not the circumstances where the debtor is defaulting intentionally. The need was seen, seeing the industrial situation, and we have seen the number of, uh, uh, as you had seen the 2008 recession, and then there have been other occasions as well where the industrial factors has affected the repaying capacity of the borrowers. And when that situation came, it was realized that the recovery is one mechanism, but what if there are other factors which is affecting the buyer's capacity for repayment and they, there may be a requirement for the resolution of that company if that is a corporate person. Of course, there are other provisions as well which, have, which are yet to come into effect with respect to the individuals and partnership form. But the, when the borrower is the corporate concern, there may be factors which now, which, which affect the repayment capacity and that may, there may not be any intentional default and there may be requirement for the resolution of the company and therefore there was reason to bring the IPC. So there is two difference, that this is the basic difference between these two acts, that why they came into effect. The, the, the object of SARPC was the earlier and faster recovery of the defaulted debt. And in case of IBC, the object was to resolve the company or the corporate persons as on today, it's about the corporate persons. So to start with, we must go through the scheme of the SARPC. I would just share this, I, I have not prepared the presentation PPT wise, but there are certain points which I'm reflecting on the screen. And I would also just request you to take the uh, uh, note of the points accordingly. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you for confirmation. 
uh, I am going to go through these 13 provisions which are required to understand the scheme of the RPC. But before that, is it the only way out to recover the debt? I would say no. Um, the persons who have gone through the uh, uh, legal course as well, they would know that there are other way out to recover the debt that is by filing the civil suit, the summary proceedings. The, the civil pro, uh, uh, code has the uh, relevant provisions. The use of which may be taken by the financial institutions or the banks to recover their debt. But as I said, when you are approaching the civil suit or you are taking the summary proceeding where in one case it the borrower may get the right to defend. In other case, there is not matter of right to defend. But when you invite the intervention of court, it is going to take years to recover. And th therefore, this RPC, which says that there is no intervention of court until and unless it is required under the provisions of the law of SARPC, which will be going through two parties which are involved here. One is borrower. The definition is section 2F. And I have specifically mentioned that bor borrower would include the guarantor over here as well. And for, for this particular definition, we will also go through that how it affects the IBC proceedings. So one party is borrower, second party is secured creditor. The definition of secured creditor is given under section 2ZD. So section 2 of the SARPC is defining so many definitions. I have taken two parties from there. One is borrower, second is secured creditor. I have given reference of one, uh, one, one uh, inlet recent judgment over here. Secured creditor would also include the assignee. So secured creditor, a person whose right has been secured either by mortgage, charge, hypothecation, uh, lien, those uh, uh, creditors who have given debt and the debt or right to repayment has been secured by mortgage charge hypothecation are called a secured creditor. Now, the secured creditor also includes assignee. Now, assignee would come into the shoe as soon as the assignee purchases the debt from the secured creditor that can be banks, financial institutions, and BFCs as defined under the provisions of the SARPC. Now, recently, NCLAT. In, in the year of 23, is recent judgment of either March or April, I have given the citation 1449 of 2022. So what had happened there, that uh, uh, financial creditor being the bank had filed Section 7 petition under IBC. I understand Section 7 is uh, 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 known to all the participants over here. Section 7 of the IBC where the secured creditor seeks to initiate the corporate insolvency resolution process against the corporate debtor. Now, Section 7 was filed by one of the secured creditor under the provisions of the IBC. And during the pendency of the IBC, this, this application or petition seeking initiation of CIRP, the secured creditor assigned its debt to one ARC. But the applicant, that means the secured creditor who sought initiation of CIRP, did not file any application seeking substitution. So once, the, what was required that when you file an application seeking Section 7 in during pendency, you assign your debt, you can come to the court and file an application saying that, see, I am no more the person who is in hand with the defaulted debt I have assigned to the other party. And this person is the assignee and may be substituted in place of me. But it was not done so. But the assignee had gone to the NCLT and had said that I am the person who has been assigned, though the secured creditor itself has not moved any application, but I being assignee in moving the application that you please put me in place of the secured creditor. Now, corporate debtor objected to it, that it is not the assignee who can come to the court and say that you put me in place of the secured creditor. It's secured creditor, that means the original secured creditor itself should come to the court and ask for the assignment or the assignee to come and take the prosecution further. So the NCLT said, no, it is not required. There is no bar. The assignee has come. Assignee has informed to the corporate debtor as well as to us, and that is enough. And we admit the company petition. So company petition came to be admitted. 
the same was challenged by the corporate debtor in NCLAT. Now, here, ground for the object, uh, objection was this, that secured creditor did not apply for the substitution. And if it is not done so, assignee is no one to come to the NCLT because the, because the original applicant was not the assignee. So NCLT has held that there is no bar if we read section five, subsection four of the SARPC Act, which gives all the rights and the assignee is wasted with all the rights and interests as a secured creditor was having. And assignee is having all the power to continue with the proceeding. And NCLT was not wrong in holding that uh, or admitting the company petition on behest of the assignee because the process was further taken over by the assignee. So these two definitions, these two parties are involved. Borrower, which includes the guarantor, secured creditor, uh, which includes the assignee as well. Please go through these uh, sections which I have mentioned to F to ZD, read with section 5.4 of the SARPC Act, which gives you the insight on the assignment of the debt. There is one recent uh, uh, proceeding has also uh, uh, come across if uh, the participants have observe this, that when assignment deed takes place, there is some stamp duty is required to be paid. Now, during the proceeding of NCLT, corporate debtor objected that assignment happened, but assignment deed is not having the proper stamp duty affixed over it. NCLT decided over it uh, in, in uh, that they are not the appropriate authority to go into it and they are only required to see that what is the amount of debt and what is the default. Further, it was challenged to NCLAT and NCLAT also held that it is not up to NCLT to see into this requirement. The proceeding has been further gone to the high court and the matter is pending over there. Uh, but these, these side by side proceedings keep on happening where the corporate debtor wants to take all the objections. Anyway, there are other definitions which are required to be uh, understood. One is asset reconstruction company. Again, interesting. As I had mentioned, the secured creditor that would include the uh, banks, financial institutions, and the asset reconstruction company as well. Now, SARPC under section three mentions that or, or provides that the asset reconstruction company would uh, do only two kinds of businesses. Section three, which talks about the registration of the asset reconstruction company, which is done by the RBI if there is no other special act. RBI regulates the functions of the asset reconstruction company and guidelines. And the certificate also has defined that there are two businesses that ARC can do. Now, if you come to section 2BA, which 2BA, the asset reconstruction company means registered with RBI under section 3 for the purposes of carrying of business of asset reconstruction or securitization or both. There is no other third function which has been defined that asset reconstruction company can do. Now, this uh, uh, case, Mr. Bahiti, if, I, if you would not mind, can you please mute yourself? Mr. Shalesh Bahiti, or oh, Nikita, can you please mute? I believe the other participants may also get. So, asset reconstruction company can enter into only two kind of businesses: that is, of asset reconstruction or of the securitization. I have uh, cited one writ petition number, which is it's still pending as on date. If uh, uh, insolvency professionals over here have uh, 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 have been taking the updates on the proceedings for the ARCL uh, uh, insolvency process, UVA, uh, UVARCL had proposed the resolution plan, and the resolution plan was approved by the NCLT. The RBI had issued the show cause notice that UVARCL being the asset reconstruction company cannot enter into any other businesses than what has been prescribed under the SARPC Act. Now, UVARCL had also proposed in the resolution plan of taking some part of the equity shares based on which the RBI had issued this notice. A writ petition came to be filed by UVARCL and 
uh, on the very first day, the show cause notice was stayed by the Delhi High Court. The arguments which were made was this for getting the stay order that section 29A of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code do not bar the ARCs to present the resolution plan. Because under the IBC, who is qualified or eligible to give the resolution plan is defined under section 29A. And section 238 says that IBC is having the overriding effect. So there is no restriction on the UBARCL to give the resolution plan. And the challenge was made to the um, uh, challenge uh, in the writ petition was uh, on the show cause notice because there was no other proceeding which had taken place. And the respondent had uh, objected on the prayer saying that we have not taken any other proceeding with just the show cause notice, so it's premature. But the Delhi High Court had observed that, yes, it may affect the other businesses of the UVRCS. So we are staying and this question of law would be decided in this repetition 9537 of 2020, which is uh, pending till on uh, till date and uh, no uh, uh, conclusion has happened till date. So this is with respect to the asset reconstruction company. Debt and default, these two definitions, of course, we know that how important this is in the uh, uh, IBC. Debt and default has been uh, defined over here as well. Uh, as a consequence of default, default of the debt which is given by the secured creditor, I again mention here that we under the SARPC Act are only concerned with the secured creditor, not the unsecured creditor. When default happens, then the secured creditor is required to classify the account of the borrower as non-performing asset. Now, what is non-performing asset is again defined under Section 2O. This is important for the both purposes. We would be seeing that how NPA or the date of NPA is relevant when we uh, uh, wish to initiate the IBC proceeding. So non-performing asset, when the amount of debt is overdue with a period of 90 days, then the financial institution or bank classifies that account as non-performing asset and which is a prerequisite to take any other step under this act by the bank or the financial institutions. So when default happens, the bank or financial institutions declare or they classify the account of the borrower as NPA, that means as per the prudential guidelines which are issued by the Reserve Bank of India, which give the guidelines that how and when and in which procedure or manner you would be classifying the account as NPA for the classifying as a standard, uh, service standard, uh, doubtful or loss account. So the classification in the manner in which it is to be required to be done, it is the RBI who does that. And there is Supreme Court ruling also in this that it is not the legislature to decide that how the classification and when the classification and NPA is to be done. And therefore, the legislature has delegated its power to the RBI to take this step or to, to uh, give a manner or procedure in which the accounts are to be classified as NPA. Because you never know, the legislature do not know that how the uh, things are functioning on ground. It is the RBI who is the regulator, who regulates the banking, banks and financial institutions. So RBI is the appropriate authority to define that when and on what procedure and manner you can define or classify the accounts as NP and for the classification as standard, substandard, doubtful or loss. But it is again mentioning, I'm, I'm mentioning that it is a prerequisite for the banks and financial institution to classify the account as an NPA before taking any further action under this act, under the provisions of the SARPC. Now, the next definition is security interest. This definition is under also IBC. The security interest definition is given under ZF. Now, security interest, that is uh, uh, when, the, when the debt of the creditor is secured with mortgages charge hypothecation as I had mentioned earlier. That, that is called a security interest and the security interest is, uh, uh, is this required to be registered. Now, 
if the company if the borrower is the company then it mandatorily has to register a security interest as we say as we know that charges are to be registered with the roc so if, if the borrower is a company then charges are required to be registered with the company and in the recent holding of enclet in the matter of vox uh, vegan finance private limited versus shri bala print pack it was held that if the borrower and if the borrower fails if the financial institution fails to register the charges with the roc then liquidator is not bound or liquidator must not consider that charge as a valid charge so section 2 zf which defines the security interest it is relevant to mention here that sarfasi act under section 22 23 also provides for the registration of the charges or the security interest with the sarsai there are provisions mentioned over here that how sarsai or the central registry would be formed how would be you would be making the registration of the charges under the sarsai but if the company if the borrower is a company it mandatorily has to register its charges under section 77 of the companies act and if borrower pays it is it is a duty of the lender to get it done and if it is not done so now it is the law federal law that liquidator is is, is not required to uh, consider that charge as a valid charge which of course would have the effect on the distribution of the realization under section 53 of the ipc so again it is it is, it is quite important the main scheme of the sarpc start from okay. chapter number 3 which talks about the enforcement of the security interest so as i had mentioned security interest which includes mortgage charge charge is the wider term which is defined under the companies act mortgage is the term which is defined under the transfer of property act mortgage may be of different kinds by deposit of title deeds equitable mortgage english mortgage mortgage etc charge is the wider term which includes mortgage and charge is defined under the companies act not under the transfer of property act now charges or the mortgage of course we as understand can happen only with respect to the immovable property the habitation uh, 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 or uh, the lien or the pledge happens with respect to the movable properties so the security interest when we talk about it could be with the tangible or with respect to the intangible asset which has to be registered in case of company with the company is it otherwise uh, here the sarsai is the uh, uh, central registry which has been constituted and the sarpc is the authority with which the financial institutions register their uh, security interest now now the main scheme of the act starts from here enforcement of the security interest that is enforcement of the mortgage application lien charge etc as i had mentioned in the beginning that the main crux of the object to bring this act into force was without intervention of court the the speedier recovery by the financial institutions or the banks the the scheme starts from section 13 sub section 1 if we read section 13 sub section 1 i'm just reading two lines of it and then we go ahead with the other provisions that not with standing anything contained in section 6969a of the transfer of property act any security interest created in favor of any secured creditor may be enforced without the intervention of the court or tribunal by such creditor in accordance with the provision of this act so to enforce your mortgage you do not have to go to the court and seek your permission as was required under the transfer of property act you cannot enforce the mortgage on your whims and fancies have to go to the court and seek the permission which is not the case over here 131 gives a clear picture you can enforce your security interest without intervention of court but how does that happen it starts from section 13 sub section 2 as i had mentioned in the beginning before taking the recourse under this provision 
the bank has to define or classify the account of the borrower as NPA. As per RBI guideline, the default is overdue of 90 days and more than account is to be classified as NPA. So once the financial institution classifies the account as NPA, issues a notice to the borrower which would include or which may include the guarantor as well, issues a notice of the 60 days period giving time to the borrower to discharge the full office liabilities. Full liability mean, me, meaning hereby is this, if the loan was given for 20 of the, the, the uh, disbursal was for 25 crore, and the installments were paid up to 10 crore and opposed which the default started happening in payment of the installments, the recall notice would say to the borrower to discharge his full liability at once. So after declaring or classifying the account as NPA, the secured creditor is wants, if wants to enforce the security interest under the provisions of SARPC, would issue the notice under section 13.2, requiring the borrower to discharge the liability in full. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I have yes. a small clarification. Can I, or also, uh, later on, like in all the questions will be taken up? Because there is a small clarification I need so far as the default is concerned. See, yeah. but NPA, ma'am, NPA, uh, what, for my understanding is that internal procedure for getting that security. So far as IBC default is concerned, uh, how do you- that uh, I would come, I would come okay. in, in the interplay. So that's okay. why I'm, I have had mentioned. So ju just after discussing up to 13.3a, I am going to come on the date of default under IBC. Okay. So the, the, this I am going to discuss in detail, and of course, this is actually going to be question to, to the participants after I discuss this. Oh, okay. Just bear with me for five minutes. We are going yes, to sir. do this. So this this uh, uh, in the Keshav Lal Khimchand Supreme Court had held that this is an additional obligation on the bank to declare or classify the account as NPA. Why this uh, requirement of uh, classifying the account as NPA and then giving 60 days period to the borrower to let it discharge its liability was this, that bank should assess that whether the default is temporary in nature and whether if proper accommodation is given to the borrower the borrower may be able to discharge his liability and that is why this period of 60 days is given and first to classify the account as NPS. Keshav Lal Khimchan, Supreme Court had held here that this is one additional obligation on the bank to first classify the account as NP and then give the opportunity to the borrower to discharge his liability in full within a period of, period of 60 days. When section 13, subsection 2 notice is issued, there are two requirements which are required to be met. The two ingredients which has to be there in the notice of section 13, subsection 2. What those two ingredients are, are there under section 13, subsection 3. These two requirements is this, your notice, that is notice which is given by the secured creditor has to give details of the amount payable by the borrower. And second, the secured asset which the secured creditor is requiring to enforce, is going ahead to enforce. So this notice has to give these two details mandatorily. Otherwise, the borrower may object to it. And even this notice can be declared as not valid if it is not having these two ingredients. So section 13, subsection 3 gives that what ingredients must be there under the notice of sub section 13, subsection 2. If these two ingredients are not there, because which generally happens, secure creditor generally keep a template and they just fill the template and issue the notice of section 13, subsection 2. And if they are missing on any of the details which are required to be there, then that notice can be declared as null and void the whole exercises will have to be taken afresh. 
Section 13, subsection 3A, which was introduced later, and why I would say that it is important, because that's the only provision under the SARPC Act where a borrower is getting an opportunity to make a representation. So how it happens? Section 13.2 gave you a period of 60 days to make the payment. The borrower may choose to pay within 60 days or may choose to object to the notice within 60 days. If the borrower is objecting to the notice, the secured creditor would either accept the objections or decline the objections. If the secured creditor is declining the, declining the objections, it would give the reasons for declining the objections. So that is section 13.3a, the only opportunity where, where the borrower is having uh, 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 in the whole scheme of the act to give a representation, the sole opportunity, and there is none else. Of, of course, they, when the opportunity would come under section 13 to file an application, I'm not going to there because there would be a pleading before the uh, court and everything. But before that, the procedure which is going, going under section 13, there is only one opportunity for the board to make the representation. If the borrower doesn't want to repay within 60 days, it may give the objections. Objections would be considered by the secured creditor, may be accepted or rejected. If rejected, it has to be with the reasons. Now we see the interplay with the IPC here. There are two judgment, judgments, both of April 23 recent judgment. I would also request um, if after this workshop, if you be able to go through the small, small judgments, these are, but give you a clarity. Here we see that most of the participants are IPs or CS. They give the advisory on initiation of CIRP or you file section seven also on behalf of your clients. When we file section seven, one of the most important uh, point is date of default. What is the date of default? Because from there you would count your limitation period. Here we see the interplay between the IBC and SARPC. SARPC, we had seen two kind of dates which is there. One is date of default and second is date of NPA. One is when the borrower stops paying, uh, paying the or repaying the liability. Second is when the overdue of the repayment is with 90 days, it is to be classified as NPA. Now I'm taking first um, uh, uh, case that is company appeal 18 insolvency 1285 of 22. At the end of discussing the timelines, I would be posing one question to the participants. And then we will discuss it how date of default is to be considered over here. So, NCLT was presented with, with this application, which ultimately came to be challenged in NCLED. And NCLED had analyzed the dates or the timelines. The date of default by the financial creditor in this case was mentioned by the financial creditor as 31st of August 2013. The bank had mentioned the second date as date of NPA as 31st of March 2014. After declaring the account as NPA, the bank had issued 13-2 notice over which the borrower had given a representation under section 13-3A on 21st of November 2014. After that, repayment from the corporate debtor came for the first time on 29th of March 2017. So on 29th of March 2017, the Borrower, here I am saying CD, that is an IBC we call uh, corporate debtor. So corporate debtor made a part payment on 29th of March 2017. When OTS had happened between the financial creditor and the corporate debtor on 31st of December 2018, post entering into OTS, a further payment was made on 6th of March 2019. The corporate debtor, sorry, uh, the NCLT on presentation of this application by the financial creditor held that this 
company petition is within limitation and CIRP can be initiated. The corporate debtor had challenged this in the NCLAT saying that the date of default is 31st of August 2013. And therefore, this section 7 petition is not maintainable because it was barred by limitation already. Now, to start analyzing this, this timeline, we must know one thing. Limitation at one limitation at Article 137 is applicable in the case of IBCs, which says that the limitation period is three years from the date when the default accrues or when the cause of action to take action accrues. The period of limitation as per Article 137 is applicable on the provisions of IBC, reason being IBC in the beginning did not provide about the limitation period. So Supreme Court had held in several cases that period of limitation is three years. Now, if we analyze this timeline, the date of default financial creditor had mentioned in section 7 petition is 31st of August 2013. NPA was mentioned in 31st of March 2014. Date of representation, repayment by the CD is 29th of March 2017. The financial institution or the uh, creditor in the NCLET said to the or made, made the submission the corporate debtor made the payment on 29th of March 2017. That means it is acknowledgement of debt. The last payment made by the corporate debtor is 6th of March 2019. That means the further acknowledgement of debt is coming in 2019. So limitation period would begin from 6th of March 2019. That means it would end in 2022. The corporate debtor is saying no. The limitation period had already expired in 2016 because the date of default is 31st of August 2013. Now, my question to the participants would be, what would be the, or when would be the limitation expires here in this present text of the case, whether it is from 31st of August 2013, we take three years period, or we take from 6th of March 2019, three years period. So either it expires in 2016 or it expires in 2022. That you have to let me know that what is your view on it. It, it would be uh, 5th March 2022. It would be 22. Yes. Anyone else? Because you say that it was acknowledged on 6th of April 2019. And that is acknowledgement of debt and from where the further period of limitation initiates. Right? That's your answer, Mr. Yes. Mato. Right. Yes. Anyone else? Yeah, I agree with Mr. Mato. Uh, the, Madam, there is the acceptance of there is a further payment yes. uh, at a subsequent date. So from that date, three year period will be counted. Okay. Someone else? Uh, Madam, same year 2022. Uh, okay, Mr. Danuka. And anyone else? Okay, so uh, most of the participants have this view and the NCLEC held exactly opposite to it. No, the answer is not 22. Reason being, I first mentioned three-year period from the date when the default accrues as the cause of action arises. That is, in the case here is 31st of August 2013. Fine. Second point, with respect to the acknowledgement of debt, it's very important to keep this in mind that acknowledgement, if you want to get the extension of the limitation period basis, the acknowledgement of debt, then acknowledgement of debt has to happen within the limitation yes. period. So limitation period had already expired in 2016. So if you would say 31st of August 2013 was the date of default, three years period came to be ended in 2016 itself. But the repayment first time came in 2017. That is after the period of expiry of three years. 
OTS also is coming after period of three years expiry. Further payment is also coming after period of expiry. So these are not giving extensions as per the limitation X, section 18 would not apply because acknowledgement also has to happen within the original period of three years. So it was held by NCLED that the company petition could not have been admitted and the order was set aside. This is first case. Has it been, and, and has it been uh, further challenged or... Uh, before Supreme Court, this, yes. this decision it's, of NCLT? It's, it's very recent order of uh, 20, March, sorry, April 23. So it's not yet been challenged. Okay, March, okay. Then. Yes. Second okay. is also very recent. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but here, second, second example is more interesting than the other one because the question which had arisen in the second case is this. Let me first put the question. The, mm -hmm. issue, was, the issue, which was, uh, or, or I would say the question of law, which had come for the consideration of the NCLT, this judgment is of the April, uh, is very recent, uh, that whether the date of default for the guarantor will be same as for the principal borrower. Whether the date of default for guarantor will be same as for the principal borrower. Meaning by this, if we take the first example, the date of default was 31st of August 2013. So can we say that the date of default of the principal borrower, that is 31st of August 2013, will also be considered as date of default by the guarantor because you all people know that the corporate insolvency resolution process can also be initiated against the corporate debtor, uh, sorry, corporate guarantor for the same yes. amount of debt, which is for the principal borrower. So Adam, the I have a small doubt. Sorry yes. to interrupt. In the first case, in the first example which we took, don't you think once an OTS comes, that overrides the earlier default and the limitation has to be calculated? No, no, that has to happen. So here the party was saying that OTS is equivalent to acknowledgement of debt because it is an extension to the previous uh, agreement or loan agreement. So that if you are again, you want to take OTS as the extension of the loan agreement that has to happen within a period of three years limitation, which didn't happen. So your argument that it gives you the extension of limitation is not acceptable. So that has to happen within a period of three years. Now, this, this second example is uh, more interesting, as I already mentioned the question or the issue which was raised by NCLED. The loan agreement is dated 23rd of March 2011. The default was mentioned as on 31st of December 2016. The account classified as NPA is 31st of March 2017. Section 13 to notice to the corporate guarantor was issued on 3rd of April 2017. Section 13.3, that is representation by corporate guarantor was given on 17th of November 2017. Against principal borrower, section 7 was filed on 5th of September 2018. Against corporate guarantor, the, DR, the secured creditor had moved to DRT on 11th of September, to September 2018. Section 7 against corporate guarantor came to be filed on 5th of February 2020. NCLT had admitted the Section 7 petition, holding it to be within the limitation period. Corporate guarantor challenged in NCLT on the ground that Section 7 was barred by limitation because three years has to be computed from 31st of December 2016. Now, 
before I discuss further and I, I let you know that what was the outcome of this litigation, does anyone has any of the views on the <coughs> decision of NCLT which had admitted? But it was challenged by the corporate guarantor saying that it is beyond limitation because the date of default has to be taken as 31st of December 2016 because it was the date of default for the principal borrower as well. Does anyone has any view on this on this issue which was raised? Uh, uh, the uh, corporate guarantor, uh, when the notice was issued to the corporate guarantor, the limitation starts from then. So you mean to say 3rd of March 2017? That's right. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, uh, in this case, whether a uh, corporate guarantor was issued any uh, recall notice along with... Uh... So the notice, this is 13-2 notice was issued to corporate guarantor. 13-2, okay. that is a period of 60 days is given to the uh, borrower, borrower which includes the corporate guarantor as well. That was issued to the guarantor on 3rd of April 2017. So Mr. Kupchandani had expressed his views that it has to start from 3rd of April 2017. Anyone else? If we take limitation from 31st of December 2016, when does it come to an end? Three years from that, uh, I mean, uh, two, uh, yes. 2019. Uh, 30th. 2019. Yes. Here, Section 7 has been filed in 2020. So, anyone else? Then, Mr. Kupchandani has any view on this? Ma'am, uh, the DRT uh, also has issued any... Uh, uh, that, was, that, was challenged, that was challenged before the High Court and the proceedings was stayed. So here in this case, nothing happened in the DRT matter. There was no decree passed, right? No. Okay. Anyone? Mr. Mato? Uh, uh, Madam, this uh, uh, they had filed within three years of uh, giving notice under Surface e Act. So, so uh, yes, this section seven was filed on fifth of February twenty twenty, and which is three years of thirteen two two CG three four two zero one seven, which is within, which is within three years. Yes, three years. Hmm. So you also so, agree with what Mr. Khoop Chindani had said? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Okay. In 2017 only, the corporate guarantor came to know about the default. Right. So from that uh, knowledge, uh, not three years expired. On 11th, uh, what do you call, 5th February 2020. So within limitation period, it is. Okay. So, Mr. Mahindran also has the same view. Mr. Danuka also agreed. I saw him uh, nodding his hand uh, head uh, for uh, what Mr. Kupchandani had said in the beginning. So, yes. The, the views of the participants over are here same as what NCLED also held and what NCLT had also held. One, one legal provision here to be kept in mind that deed of guarantee is also taken as an independent contract. So whenever the guarantee deed is happening or is, is entered into between the parties, we know there are tripartite agreement, but the corporate guarantee agreement is true to be treated as an independent agreement. The Agreement of the corporate guarantee or agreement of the guarantee has its own, own clauses and that guarantee is of the continuous nature or ordinary guarantee. How the guarantee is to be invoked, that is by on demand or issuance of the notice or is in any other manner, is everything is given in that deed of guarantee which has to be considered independently if you have to take any action against the guarantor. In this particular case, the NCLEC had examined and assessed several judgments of the Supreme Court, which says that the liability of the guarantor would be uh, assessed as per the 
clauses of the guarantee agreement. And in this present text of the case, it there was a clause in the agreement that the liability of the guarantor to make payment would come on demand. So section 13.2 notice is a demand. The demand was issued on 3rd of April 2017. So NCLED said that there may be facts of the cases where the date of default of the principal borrower would be same for the corporate guarantor or the guarantor, but there may be some facts of the cases where the date of default for the guarantor may be different from the principal borrower. In this case, it was different because here the guarantee deed itself was mentioning that the liability to make payment would come on demand. Demand was raised from third on 3rd of April 2017. 60 days period was given for making the payment. The 60 days period expired from that 61st day, the limitation would begin. The three days, three years period uh, would be taken from the expiry of the 60 days period of th section 13.2. So this is also very recent judgment. And it, now you have the clarity when section seven is to be initiated at that point of time, if you are examining on, for, on, your, on, on behalf of your client any section 7 petition or you are drafting your section 7 petition, please mention the date of default because in the first case, in company appeal 1285, the uh, bank at the first occasion had also uh, uh, forgot or say that they, they missed to mention the date of default and they were then further given the opportunity to put an affidavit and clarify that what as per their record the date of default is. So, this has the clarity, this big confusion between date of default and date of NPA, which is to be taken from as, as a state of default. So we have to take the date of default as mentioned by the banks, not date of NPA is the date of default because Supreme Court has already held in Kirinov judgments, including Lakshmi Pansurana, uh, Jignesha, BK Educational Services. You may uh, have a look on these judgments. Two notes here. <clears throat> As uh, just now, when we were discussing these two examples, one of the persons had asked that what had happened to the DRT proceeding, which was uh, initiated in that second case, really does not make any difference. Because it is a settled law now now that if the secured creditor had already taken any step under the SARPC Act, has all the opportunity to initiate Section 7 petition. So that's not a bar if we have already taken SARPC action earlier. So this has been held in Rakesh Kumar Gupta, Mahesh Mansur and Post that there is one Supreme Court judgment of Justice Nariman and I'm not recalling the judgment which had held that this case, there is no bar for initiating Section 7 petition if we have already initiated SARPC action under the provisions of the SARPC Act. There is no obstruction to initiate the Section 7 petition. Second, there was a judgment by the Honorable Supreme Court. Um, Justice Indra Banerjee's judgment of Sheshnath Singh and another where it's, it's very interesting. Uh, actually, the NCLED had uh, decided to not accept the decision of the Supreme Court. So there are various judgments after the promulgation of SARPC Act. Supreme Court held one thing that the proceedings which are taken under Section 13 are not to be taken as civil proceedings. Because section 13 you are doing without the intervention of court. If you are having any difficulty in section 13, you go to section 14, which we will be discussing uh, just after it. But there, there is a precedent holding that the proceedings under the SARPC under section 13 is not to be treated as the civil proceedings. But this judgment of Sheshnath had said this. If the SARPC proceedings have been initiated, secure creditor had taken the steps under Section 13 and then now wants to go to uh, Section 7 of the IBC, then the time consumed for prosecuting 
or for uh, uh, taking the uh, actions under the SARPC Act would be excluded for the purposes of computing the limitation period. But after this judgment, the NCLED in two or three judgments, one was for one was the larger bench, had said that Sheshnath is not holding the correct law because that has already been held by the Supreme Court in the previous judgments that Section 13 proceedings cannot be considered civil proceedings. And therefore, the Limitation Act, Section 14, which says that if any litig litigant consumes its time bona fidely before any forum, which is not a correct forum, then the time consumed and lost in that proceeding can be taken as excluded from the computation of the limitation period for you, for which that litigant has to file an application under section seven, under section five of the limitation act and pray for the exclusion of the period which was lost because that person had wrongly gone to a wrong forum. So Sheshnath judgment said that- uh, Ma'am, just a minute, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So section five, uh, like, you know, when I'm filing a section seven application uh, in this matter, I mean, in context with this, then I can pray, for, I mean, in the uh, petition itself that uh, uh, the repetition period uh, should be condoned. So you, or you have to file exactly. an additional. There, there you would be give, giving your date of default by excluding that period. And you can explain that how you have come to the date of default that by excluding the period. But uh, uh, in this particular case, I want to explain you that the judgment of Sheshnath was not taken as to be a correct law because the time which was lost in this RPC proceeding cannot be taken as a, a proceeding before the civil, the civil court, which is required under Section 14 of the Limitation Act to take exclusion of. So yes, if you want to take any exclusion for the computation of the limitation period from the date of default, then first come to the date of default that you want to put in the section seven, give the date of default and then explain there in the pleadings that how you have come to this particular date of default. Okay, there is no separate application for, uh, con for condonance, uh, like, you know, uh, taking that section five exclusion separately. No, no, okay. no. Okay. Okay. Ma'am, I had a question. Even, See, yes. there is a judgment of BK Educational Services Private Limited versus Para Gupta. That's a 2019 judgment, 2019, yes. 1 SCC 633. Yes. Basically, where it says that in paragraph 14, 42, that it says it is thus clear that the, since the Limitation Act is applicable to applications filed under section 7 and 9 of the IBC from the date of the inception of the court, Article 137 of Limitation Act gets attracted. Right. The right to sue therefore accrues when the default occurs. This, uh, this right. is the sentence of paragraph yeah. 42. Exactly the same. It, yeah, if the default has occurred over three years prior to the date of filing of application, the application would be barred under 137 of Limitation right. Act, save right. and except in those cases wherein the facts of the case, Section 5 of Limitation Act may be applied yes. to condone the delay in filing such application. Exactly. So, mentioned 130, 137, three years applies from the date of default, but in, 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 in given cases, you can take the recourse of Section 5, Section 5. Uh, uh, under the Limitation Act, and right. you, you can, you can so justifi it. justifiable region, yes. then you can uh, get this uh, uh, period condoned for your oh. bona fide mistakes and bon bona fide filing in other 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 judicial forum. Exactly. So section 14 of Limitation Act is one of the reasons that why you want to seek the condonation of delay. So section 14 says that if you have lost some period before the wrong forum, then you want that period to be excluded from the computation of the limitation period. The exact yes. what you had read from the BK Educationalist. And the same thing that we also uh, taken in the first example, section 137 of the Limitation Act applies. Second, the date of uh, uh, default is the date when the default accrued and cause of, cause of action accrues. So it's not the date of NPA. And the acknowledgement of debt has also to be happened within the period of three years. So, Ma'am, uh, ma should be termed as a wrong uh, forum or other forum? Wrong forum, that means if you, if you had gone to the uh, uh, 
authority or if we can just read the exact uh, term of section 14 one second let me also open it or i i'm if give me one minute i get the limitation act as well just uh, excuse me for a minute Ma'am, so the current law is what is about the, you know, Honorable Supreme Court decided in Sheshnath Singh's case, right? Right. So that means Sarfesi proceedings are to be excluded. Sarfesi proceedings, the Sheshnath case, there are like, other cases as well before Sheshnath, which says that Sarfesi proceedings are not to be treated as proceedings before the civil court. The, the time period that you... Uh, 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 spend for section 13 or section 14 because just we will read now when we come to section 14 the proceedings before the dm or cmm they do not have any adjudicating power or they do not have power of the civil court and that's why we cannot consider it as to be the civil proceeding and the time period cannot be taken as to be excluded so the enclad after sheshna judgment there has been two or three judgments which have not accepted the law which has been let down by the Sheshnath judgment in Supreme Court. So basically, uh, the ANCLAD is saying that the BK Educational Services judgment is the correct one. And that's the correct one. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, Justice Indra Banerjee's decision in Sheshnath Singh is not mm -hmm. the because the BK Educational he very clearly says 137 applies. In given case, you can take recourse of section 5, and section 5 has ground under, say, I mean. You can rely on for section 14 for getting the exactly, period. exactly exactly section 14 and there is one more judgment ma'am there is a judgment of tech tech sarb engineers private limited versus sangvi movers that's a 2022 decision but i don't uh -huh. know what uh what what was held there that this is also on the point of limitation sir uh i would suggest you still go through this judgment why uh, the 1285 reason being Mm -hmm. very crisp judgment of NCLEC. It has taken into consideration all the recent judgment of the Supreme Court which had uh, held on the limitation point mm -hmm. and has given timeline very beautifully to explain you that how you have to compute the limitation period. 1285 would consider has taken into consideration all the relevant judgments of the Supreme Court. This is basically so, an NCLEC, NCLEC judgment, this 1285. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And but it has taken reference of all these judgments of the Supreme Court, which had held on the limitation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it would be it would be quite fruitful for you. And it's a very small judgment, but very beautifully written uh, without leaving any confusion in mind. That's um, by Asur Bhushan, Justice Asur Bhushan. Sorry? What is the current law? Sorry? What That's is the current law? Um, there are two voices coming, so... Yes, Mr. Kumar, first, you were saying something. That's the current law, yes. And Mr. Koop Chandani, you were saying something. What is the current law? What is the current law? So current law is this. The date with respect to the date of default. Because judgment, this, the judgment in 1285 by Justice Ashok Bhushan or by somebody else? This Mr. Rakesh Kumar Jain. Rakesh Kumar Jain. Yes. <laughs> no, so ma'am, uh, we have to exclude the time or no under the Sarfesi proceedings? No, I, I would, I my view taking into consideration, I would also um, uh, at the end if I get a chance to lay my hand on the previous judgments of the Supreme Court saying that the Sarfesi proceedings are not civil, I will let you know. Because this judgment of NCLET, uh, which I had not mentioned over here, the larger bench one, let me try putting in in the note before I... Uh, conclude this session or I would put in the chat box in the uh, session today itself so you can go through that judgment which uh, has explained that why Sheshna judgment would not be correct in the eyes of law. Okay. So that I'll be trying to do today itself. Now a uh, very interesting part comes here because uh, uh, the, the, you, you would see that when, when we come to section 13 4 which is the i would say a proper enforcement actions which the so, uh, secured creditor takes after issuance of the notice so section 13 2 was a procedural part now all the actions are to be taken under section 13 4 if the payment has not been received within the 60 days 13 3 a had already explained 13 4 very 
uh, important uh, uh, section which starts like this. That in case the borrower fails to discharge his liability in full within the period specified in subsection 2, that is, that is 60 days, the secured creditor may take recourse to one or more of the following measures to recover his secured debt. So section 13.4 mentions the measures that can be taken by the secured creditor to enforce the debt. The first step generally the secured creditor takes after issuance of 13.2 and after expiry of 60 days is taking symbolic possession. They take the symbolic possession and pose that they go for the auction and for selling of the property. Now, enforcement actions are to be read with the rules which have been made or uh, uh, under uh, the provisions of the Act, which are called as security uh, enforcement uh, rules. Rule number eight and nine with respect to the movable properties and rule number five with respect to the movable properties. So as and when the secure creditor wants to sell and to enforce the securities under section 13, subsection 4 by selling them, then rule number 8 and 9 are required to be read. So, as I said, to start with generally, all the secure creditor take the symbolic possession. But there are other measures also under section 13, subsection 4, which are mentioned. First is to take possession. Possession can be taken how? One, as, as I mentioned, symbolic possession. If you take symbolic possession after uh, taking symbolic possession within seven days, you issue one public announcement, letting the public know that you have taken over the possession of the uh, possession of the asset or the secured asset. First thing. Second interesting point is this. And I give a practical example also because this has happened in one of the so yeah, one, one, of, one of the liquidation proceedings under the provisions of the IBC. Section 13.4b says that the secured creditor can even take over the management of the business of the borrower, including the right to transfer by way of lease, assignment, sale for realizing the secured asset. That's section 13.4b. That is second measure. So first measure that you took is to take over the possession that can be Symbolic position, physical position. Second is that you can take over the management of the business of the borrower. Third is that you appoint any person as manager for the secured asset that you have taken possession of. Or fourth is to issue the garnishy order or the garnishy notice. I, I would take the example for 13.4b and 13.4d in one of the proceedings that I would explain, but before that. Ma'am, uh, so far as like you know, taking the symbolic position is concerned. So you, you are muted. Suppose like, you know, going for symbolic position. So mm -hmm. do we, uh, uh, do we require to seek permission or intimation from the district magistrate? I am coming to that. Sir. No, no, I'm coming to that. That's okay. section 14. So I'm going step by step. Okay, so let me first come to this. Okay. When, you, when you want to take the possession, so I am on 13.4a. How can you take the possession? You go and directly take the possession, first thing. And if you go and directly take the physical possession and you are facing any obstruction, then you can seek the assistance of the administrative authorities for which you can go to the district magistrate and apply for the assistance for taking over the possession of the company, no, sorry, of the business, uh, of the asset. So either you are directly going and you are facing no obstruction, so you would be taking uh, the possession of the secured asset. It may happen that you may go there, but you are facing the obstruction, so you first go face the obstruction and then go to the DM and take the uh, assistance of the administrative authority. Or third thing, what you can do, that first go to the DM and take the assistance, go with the assistance, any which way you can do. And Supreme Court has already held that there is no precondition first to go to the DM and they take the assistance and only then you can take the physical possession. It's not required. 
Suppose, madam, the property is locked, then in that case? It's up to you, sir. If it is locked, you try. So the, there are certain things under the service when you uh, go to go to the DM, receiver is appointed. Receiver can be any person, officer of the court, or even the advocate now as per the Supreme Court judgment. The receiver would go uh, a play, uh, paste the notice and uh, follow the procedure which has been given under the rule 8 and 9. If it is locked, then take the administrative uh, order from the DM and accordingly you can take the possession by pasting the notice which must be visible on the notice board giving detail of the secured creditor who is taking the possession and under the possession of whom this uh, property has now come. So that has that has been explained uh, under rule 8 and 9. Um, so my, my point to start with here was this. Ma'am, a small but uh, it might uh, sound silly. Suppose I have pasted it, somebody removes it, then how to take that evidence of? <laughs> you you paste it and then uh, uh, the receiver who would be there would be one of the witnesses because once you paste it or once you take uh, the uh, uh, process for taking over the possession, generally you keep the witnesses also of the vicinity. So that is one of the way to keep the witness that you had uh, taken the possession. Okay. Ma'am, better to take the police along. So that's that, that's what I have mentioned. There are three ways to do this. One is if you see that there are there is not going to be any obstruction, go directly. If you think that there is going to be obstruction, first go to the DM, take the police along with you after getting the order from the DM, and then go for taking over the position. Or third way is that you go and then you face the obstruction and then you go to the DM and take the position. So it is up to you what what process that you want to. Take. This is also, there, there is one of the uh, judgment of the Supreme Court, which has explained that in any of these three ways you can do, because there was a confusion as Mr. Mathu had raised in the beginning that, is it required first always to go to the DM and take the order and only then go to the uh, property for the taking over possession. So this has been explained in one of the Supreme Court's judgment, which I had uh, mentioned later, that is, is, is not uh, necessary. But uh, coming to the next point, here we see again interplay between the IVC and Section 13, Subsection 4. The first order of Indian Overseas Bank and REM Infrastructure Limited is of the Supreme Court's uh, judgment. What did happen in this case that Section 13, 2 notice was issued, 60 days period had expired, the secured creditor had taken over the possession under section 13, subsection 4, had put the property on auction. There is requirement under section uh, under rule 8 and 9 that when you put the property on auction and you are receiving the consideration, then 25% of the consideration, including EMD, has to be received on the same or the other day, the date of the auction or the next date. And then uh, next 75% to be received within a period of 90 days. If you remember in the liquidation process schedule, one of the IVC, the same timeline is given of the 90 days period beyond that interest is uh, levied. So, uh, sorry, 30 days and then beyond that uh, interest is levied and maximum period in the, in the IVC schedule one is 90 days and after that liquidator can cancel the sale. But, but uh, without confusing that I am on the CIRP proceeding. Section 13.2 was issued, Section 13.4, possession was taken, auction was held, 25% was received. As per the rules of the SARPC, if the borrower is not able to make the payment uh, within the prescribed period uh, of the auction, that a borrower can seek the extension. Before 75% of this consideration, sale consideration was paid, the borrower filed Section 10 under IBC. Moratorium starts. So NCLT said that SARPC proceedings has to be stopped. NCLED also held the same thing. Supreme Court, the matter had come to the Supreme Court. The Indian Overseas Bank had said that I had already conducted auction. 25% had already come. It's only part consideration which is coming and I had filed the claim form because I came to know that section 10 has been initiated. So I filed the claim for the 
remaining 75%, but this does not stop me to recover the another 75% of the option sale. So surplusive proceeding can also go along. I must be allowed to recover the rest 75% from the bidders. So here, the Supreme Court had analyzed the provision of the IBC as well as SARPC. The Supreme Court held that as per Rule 9 of the Security Enforcement Rules, the sale is completed only when 100% consideration comes, which was which didn't happen in this present text of the case. Secondly, because the sale was not completed as per the provisions of SARPC before commencement of CIRP, then section 14 comes into picture and moratorium section 14 very categorically bars the enforcement of securities under SARPC Act. And section 238 of IBC comes into picture. Section 238 says that IBC overrides the other contrary provisions of any other provisions of court. So therefore, this uh, uh, Indian Overseas Bank who had recovered 25%, we are not concerned, that's bad in law and you cannot con continue with the recovery of the next 75%. We, you cannot recover the security interest during the moratorium period and uh, the judgment of the enclave was hold to be good. But this is different when we come to the liquidation process. Ma'am, uh, was that 25% was, uh, I mean, uh, deposited? That must, have been, that must have been returned. That must have okay. been returned, yes. But when we come to liquidation, that's that has become very interesting. Um, I was going to take example of 13.4b before I uh, uh, discuss the liquidation process. Many of the IPs have faced this situation. Like uh, one of the cases which I am handling, what is happening over there? Uh, are you are you conversant with Section 52 of Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code? Yes. What Section 52 is all about? That is about uh, relinquishment of uh, security interest. Very right. Now, there is one case where the, the, the corporate debtor has installed its plant and machinery over a land which does not belong to the corporate debtor. It belongs to a partnership firm. And the partners of that firm are majorly the same as the directors of that corporate debtor or the ex-management of the corporate debtor now. So land belongs to a partnership firm. On that land, the plant and machinery has been installed by the corporate debtor. That land by the partnership firm was also mortgaged to the secured creditor of the corporate debtor to secure the debt of the corporate debtor. Am I clear? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So there is corporate debtor has installed this plant and machinery on the land which belongs to a partnership firm. Partnership firm had also secured, uh, has also given its land as security interest to the secured creditor of the corporate debtor. No resolution plan came and the company has gone into the liquidation. There is only one secured creditor and the secured creditor decides not to relinquish its security interest into the liquidation estate of the company. That secured creditor is saying that I'm not relinquishing the asset or the security interest of the corporate debtor. Now, what, what asset of the corporate debtor was only plant and machinery? The land does not belong to the corporate debtor. So first answer me this question, whether the liquidator can include the land of the partnership firm in the liquidation estate of the company or not. It should. As per my understanding, it should. Anyone is? Uh, Madam, yes, it, it should because uh, uh, it has been mortgaged to the security lender. Okay. Anyone else? I think it should not because the entities are both different. Entities are different. 
Can we just yes. look at this? Uh, yes. Ma'am, I'm John. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Actually, the, uh, when they give the land for constructing the company, they supposed to have executed some lease agreement or anything. Mm -hmm. That right, that right can be included in the liquidation assets, ma'am. Right, very right. Okay. So th that right, uh, they can assign to somebody else uh, on certain value, or based on which they, uh, the liquidator can realize money. Okay. That's a quite interesting point raised by Mr. John that if there was land on which the security, on which the plant and machinery must have been installed, there must have been some lease agreement between the corporate debtor and that partnership firm, then that lease right shall be treated as liquidation estate and that lease right can be assigned to someone else and recover the money. Would there be any limitation with respect to the assigning of the lease? Because suppose that lease is for the limited period and uh, what if that limitation or, or, or the lease period is coming to be expired within this liquidation period or that lease period is, you know, has to be time to time renewed and that is not being renewed yet. Is what these kind of limitation may also come. Then what happens? Yeah, naturally, this kind of limitation will be there. The proposed buyer, they have to make an arrangement with the uh, owner of the land, whether to continue the lease or renew or whatever it is. Based on that, the plant and machinery will fetch a value, whether it may be a higher value or whatever it is, based on this one. Otherwise, they we have to sell the uh, plant and machinery on scrap basis. Hmm. Exactly. So this, this is something happening or already happened in one or two cases, both in CIRP and liquidation. In one of the cases, the same situation was there in the CIRP process and in the resolution plan. The resolution applicant and the secured creditor had agreed that for the land, we would find a buyer, but we want this land only to be part of this resolution plan, even when this land is not belonging to the corporate debtor. And in the case of liquidation, the secured creditor is saying that if I am going to enforce my security interest on the plant and machinery independently, I'm not going to fetch any money because it's all is a scrap. So it has to go along with the land. Now land right, land has already been mortgaged with the secured creditor and secured creditor has already further gone ahead with the SRPC proceeding against the partnership firm. So secure creditors say that it's better for me to not to relinquish my security interest on the plant and machinery as well and let me sell both of them under one single notice of the, under the SARPC proceeding. That's going to maximize the value of the asset of the corporate debtor. This is one part. Uh, if I come to my question again, accept the lease right, because suppose there are those limitations which come with respect to the lease rights expires in between, not renewed or whatever, then whether you would be able to include the uh, land of the partnership firm in the liquidation asset, estate. If we go to the definition under section, uh, sorry, not definition, but the provision of section 35 and 36, I afraid that you will not be able to include the asset of the guarantor as the asset of the corporate debtor because that doesn't belong. It's not under the ownership of the corporate debtor. Yes. So section 35 and section 36 very categorically says the liquidator takes over the asset which are under the ownership of the corporate debtor. There is already enclosed one or two judgments saying that you cannot include the guarantor's property into the liquidation estate of the corporate debtor. So this is one way where the secured creditor is not relinquishing its right and saying that let me realize it because there is land also attached to it and I want to realize and I want to maximize the uh, asset of the corporate debtor. It's better for me to realize it outside the liquidation process. There is one more way which I have seen people doing is this. There was a land, suppose a 1200 acre land of the corporate debtor not relinquished, not relinquished by the creditors, secure creditors. There are four, four secure creditors. They did not relinquish their security interest. Uh, sorry, they 
relinquished their security interest in the liquidation process. That means they are saying liquidator to enforce the security interest on their behalf. But that land was also having some portion of 200 acre belonging to the promoters. And that land is inseparable. So you cannot say that that land which belongs to the promoter is coming in somewhere between uh, in the mid of the land of the corporate debtor. So what secured creditor decided over there? That whosoever buys the land of the corporate debtor in the auction process, we will enter into the private treaty with the same buyer under the provisions of the SARPC. Now, there is a recent amendment, not that recent, but it's still, I would say, recent amendment in the Rule 8 of the SARPC. Earlier, private treaty was not allowed. There was ways to sale the property under SARPC, that is to issue the public notice for the auction or invite tenders from the public. But private treaty was not included over there. And then Supreme Court in one of the judgment had said that you cannot enter into the private treaty without the permission of the borrower. To do away with that Supreme Court judgment, an amendment to the Rule 8 came into picture, which says that the private treaty would depend, I would, I would read that rule 8, sub rule 8, that sale by any method other than the public action or public tender shall be on such terms as may be settled between the secured creditor and proposed purchaser in writing. And before that, rule 8, sub rule 5 says the manner in which the Immovable property, because rule eight is with respect to the immovable property, can be realized. One is by obtaining quotations from the persons. Second, by inviting tenders from the public. Third, by holding auctions, including through e-auction e mode. And fourth is by private treaty. The secure creditor in that case decided that whosoever comes and is declared as successive bidder, successful bidder in the liquidation process of the corporate debtor with the same bidder, we will enter into the private treaty as per the rule eight, sub rule five, and read with sub rule eight of the security interest enforcement rules 2002. And that was successful as, as well. They could successfully uh, do this arrangement. So this, uh, Similar thing had recently come before the NCLET in the company appeal 18 insolvency 456 of 22. And so all ma'am, ma that means uh, both these acts, I mean, uh, IBC as well as RPC go hand in hand. Uh, uh, in liquidation process, yes. In liquidation. Yes, yes. Because in CIRP, it would be treated as, as recovery, but in oh, section 14, yes. Section 14 stops it. In liquidation, the secure creditor is still is allowed to individually independently realize the security interest. If you have read the regulation 37 of liquidation process, it is allowed for the secured creditor to realize the security interest under SARPC. So liquidation process is completely different from the CIRP because CIRP is collective process. And the, the, the liquid, liquidation process also like you know imposes like you know moratorium. No, there is difference, sir. Liquidation is for the purpose of realization. Moratorium is imposed, but not the way it is under Section 14. It's completely different. What Section 35 says with respect to the moratorium, sir? Let me read it. With respect to the moratorium under Section... <coughs> um, under liquidation process. It is not well defined as uh, thirty-three we subsection five, subject to section fifty-two. When a liquidation order has been passed, no suit or other liquidation proceeding shall be instituted by or against the corporate debtor. It's with respect to the not recovery or realization of the security interest, which is in case of section fourteen under under the moratorium. 
which categorically prohibits the recovery or secure enforcement of security interest under this RPC. Plus, liquidation process, if the, uh, if the secured creditor decide not to relinquish their security interest, they can very well go under the RPC because section 52 says that the secured creditor or the creditors which are deciding not to relinquish their security interest can realize under any applicable provisions of the law. That is the language of section 52. Then you go to regulation 37, which says that you the, the secured creditor can uh, take the process of SARPC for realization of the secured, uh, secured interest. So in these two cases, Company Appeal 80, 456 of 22 and 147 of 22. The um, secured creditor as well as the liquidator had sought the permission from the NCLT to come out with a common advertisement of auction because some of the property is with the secured creditor and some is with the liquidator and they wanted to issue one common public announcement with the joint reserve price for the maximization of the value, which NCLT had allowed. The promoter had challenged it. The NCLT said that there is no problem because if there is the object of maximization of the value and this is the way in which the value of the asset is to be maximized and there is no bar in doing that and promoter should not have any objection to it because even if there was no joint advertisement, then two surface action could be taken by the secured creditor. So there is no the objection taken by the promoter is not logical in that scenario. One second. I want to take one more example, which is uh, far more different and interesting. Interesting. Okay, this this is the judgment which I was referring to with respect to uh, amendment of uh, Rule Eight Sub Rule Eight. So, Honorable Supreme Court in the judgment of Rajiv Subramaniam on fourteenth of March two thousand fourteen had decided that the Terms for the private ETS may be settled between the party would necessarily include the borrower and in sale by private entity without the consent of the borrower mortgage would be void. So this has been done away with by rule 8 sub rule 8 that sale by any methods other than public auction or public, ten, uh, public tender shall be on such terms as may be settled between the secured creditor and the proposed purchaser in right. So the requirement of taking the consent of the borrower has been done, done, done away with. Still, I would say one thing, the public sector banks still do not prefer to have the private treaty. They still prefer the other mode of uh, uh, sale. And uh, when other mode of sale are not being, uh, or, or are not giving any result, then only they uh, prefer to go to the private treaty, but they take the private treaty as one of the last resort. They do not take the private duty as the first resort, but of course the facts and circumstances as I, as I had I mentioned in one of the cases in, uh, uh, when we started on this example, there the all four secured credit, creditors had agreed and had taken approval from their uh, internal management to do the private treaty with the successful bidder. The another example that I wanted to take on section 13. Ma uh, sorry, ma'am, but uh, in your, as in your previous example, so uh, the view is that uh, the partnership firm cannot be forced to sell the land in uh, either in liquidation or, or uh, by whatever way. They cannot be forced. The, my, uh, I wanted to say this, sir. The land of the partnership firm is not land of the corporate debtor and liquidator has no right to include it in the liquidation estate. But if the land is not being able to include it in the liquidation estate, then how would you realize or maximize the value of the asset, which is only plant and machinery? As soon as you remove it from the land, it would lose its value. Then you are having two ways to do it. One, either the secured creditor uh, without relinquishing the security interest go and uh, issue the common uh, public announcement to realize the land as well as the plant and machinery along with it. If it does so very well. Second is being liquidator, you seek the permission uh, from the NCLT. Let secured creditor not, uh, secured creditor also relinquish its right on the secured security interest. So you are having plant and machinery already in your hand. Then 
you go to the NCLT as in the second case I had mentioned where the joint reserve price was decided between the secured creditor and the uh, liquidator. Because in this case, the land is with the secured creditor and liquidator has the plant and machinery. Both can come to a consensus and issue the joint reserve price uh, advertisement and recover the money and then settle the dues accordingly under section 53. So these- Ma'am, but that is voluntary on the part of the secured creditor, whether you want to dispose of or not. But, 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 sir, there is one, uh, uh, I would say very important point. The liquidation process has to be completed within one year. And as you all have been facing it, the NCLTs are not easily giving any extensions. They are giving extension, but first they would give for three months and for six months. So first thing, secure creditor cannot be given indefinite time period to realize a security interest. So suppose being liquidator, if you want to be very vigilant with all the powers and duties that you are having, you can say to the secured creditor, okay, you want to realize this, I'm giving you six months to do that. Please read Regulation 21A for that. Regulation 21A of the liquidation process, if you would read that, you would give and you would take an impression that secured secured creditor is not having indefinite time period to realize a security interest. Six months period, if he has done so, if he is able to realize it is fine. Otherwise, you take this property in your hand. After taking it in your hand, go to the NCRT, seek permission that you want to realize it, but you want to realize it jointly because otherwise it is not going to yield any value. This is the way that you can seek from the NCLT after having the joint consensus with the secured creditor because the land is still would be with the secured creditor. And that is not the property of the corporate debtor. So 21A is quite important regulation and there are so many controversies also coming because 21A is not clear in its own verdicts. There are so many uh, uh, conflicts or contrary uh, views are coming in our 21A. So to, one to, to sum up, I mean, to, I mean, at the basic level, basically the land which belongs to the partnership firm cannot be included in the liquidation as a state right. under the IBC. Right. As, uh, section 36 or 37, whatever. Yes. So, so and if at all, if there has to be a joint realization or joint sale, then for that, you need the consent of the partnership firm so that the value can be maximized. Unless until that is there, it won't. It would be difficult to include the land of partnership firm in the liquidation asset. Estate. I would not say consent of the partnership firm. It is of the secured creditor. Partnership firm. Yeah, part yeah, secure, yeah, secured. Yeah, secured creditor. Yeah. Right, right. So this is the way the the uh, liquidators are operating in such of the cases. And you would these two examples I have given. There is one more. Ma'am, ma ma uh, 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 one more thing is that. Suppose like, you know, uh, six months property couldn't be realized. Okay. By the, by the, by the secure financial creditors or whosoever. So like, you know, the uh, property automatically comes back to liquidator. Number one. First thing, write, write to the um, secured creditor that you have not been able to realize the secured uh, security interest within a period of uh, six months. And, uh, uh, as per regulation 21A, there is prerequisite first to meet out the expenses. First, yes, this is also very important. If you, sir, have seen 21A uh, and if uh, all the participants are having this regulation in hand, please go through 21A, which also puts obligation on the secured creditor in advance to make payment of the estimated liquidation cost within a period of 90 days from the liquidation commencement date. If that is not done so, then automatically the property would come back to the liquidator. That is regulation 21A. Second regulation, which says that when the security interest is realized and at the end of 180th day, the realization of the security interest is in excess of the debt of the secured creditor, then the excess would have to be given to the liquidator. 
from which you take this inference that the period to realize the security interest is the 180 days, that is six months. From where I was coming, that why it's six months. So being liquidator, it's better that when security interest is decided by the secured creditor not to be relinquished, write immediately quoting 21A, because you will have to give the estimate of the liquidation cost. Because if you are not communicating how secured creditor is going to meet out the requirement of regulation 21A, and ultimately things would come to you on you as liquidator that you never informed as the cost, and that's why secured creditor could not meet out. So as soon as secured creditor decides to not to relinquish, you can take this process of 21A right to the secured creditor, ask for the estimated liquidation cost proportionate, which is uh, secured creditor is required to meet. And after 180 days, if it's not able to realize a security interest, you can write to them and seek the relinquishment of the security interest in your favor. If the secured creditor is not cooperating, file an application with the NCLT on the ground that the secured creditor cannot be having the indefinite time period because liquidation period itself is only of one year, one year period. And then you take over the process of the liquidation accordingly. So that means after the expiry of six months, I should initiate in the capacity of liquidator or like, you know, it, is, it goes hand in hand. Like, you know, when I come to know that whether it has been relinquished, I mean, uh, the property has been sold by the secured creditors. So they are having this obligation to keep you informed. Okay. So when you write your first email, uh, asking the secured creditor to fulfill the requirement of 21A, please list out all these things that you need to be timely updated of any public announcement which is being issued by the secured creditor, date of auction, the outcome of the auction, these things that you have to write in your very first mail where you refer to 21A regulation. Okay. Now, uh, uh, we were discussing this 13 subsection 4. We discussed that you take over the possession and then you sell the property and we discussed that how it is interplayed with the IBC. Very interesting uh, provision 13.4b, 1b, in which the secured creditor takes over the management of the business of the borrower. I take example of one of the IBC proceedings, which in my knowledge is the sole example of uh, such action being taken by the secured creditor. Though it's going under dispute, so I may not be able to reveal uh, the names of the parties right now. But let me just give you as an example. So there is one EPC company. That EPC company is having 31 projects all over India. So these projects are mostly in the nature of JVs. There is one JV which has been awarded one government project. And that government project is of the high public interest. As per the JV agreement, the management of that JV is 4 is to 2. That means 4 persons of the corporate debtor would be in that management. 2 persons of the technical member of that JV, which is of some, which is some foreign entity. Corporate debtor, of course, I am calling it corporate debtor, so it has gone into CIRP. No resolution plan came that the corporate debtor has gone into the liquidation. For this particular project, the secured creditor had given the project a specific loan. So there is only one creditor which has security interest over the receivables of the project. So this JV's project is of the government project, of the public interest, money would come in the form of receivables. There are certain movable asset on which the secured creditor is having the interest. So there are two kinds of security interest in this case. One is receivables, second is on the movable properties because the project which is being constructed is for the government. So on the immovable property, there is no ownership of the company. That ownership belongs to the government. Now, the company has gone into liquidation. <laughs> the secured creditor decides 
to not to relinquish a security interest. But the project is going concern. The project cannot be liquidated and the project is being constructed for the government in the high public interest. So there cannot be a liquidation process or dissolution process. This cannot be in the public interest because then so many things would emerge which, which, which will be very difficult to entertain by any of the stakeholder of this company. Secure creditor, what it does? It takes its measure under section 13.4b. What it does, it says that this project that is JV is having management of 4 is to 2. The corporate debtor is the lead member of this JV. What being secured creditor I'm doing, I am substituting the management with my officers. So what secure creditor did, it appointed its own uh, administration administrator over this JV project and took over the project's business of the borrower. From that day, that JV is being run by the administrator appointed by the secured creditor because in this case, secured creditor decided to not to relinquish and after taking symbolic possession, of that project and uh, uh, because the movable property is over there. So when you go for taking the symbolic possession, you take the inventory, take the punch nama, put uh, paste the notice that you are taking the symbolic possession with respect to the movable properties. Project has to go, project is going, but all is being administered by the secured creditor because it has substituted its management by appointing its own administrator. This is going on. There are certain disputes which is being taken care by the NCLT or NCLT at relevant point of time. Ma'am, uh, secure creditors, uh, do they need to um, take approval of RBI for this taking management and control of? No, that is that is that is provided under this act, section thirteen four B. Okay. They are allowed to take over the management, and once they take over the management under thirteen four B. Section 15 comes into picture. Section 15 says the manner and effect of takeover of management. Then how would you take over? You would issue the public notice. A manager would be appointed. That manager will be taking all those decisions which in case of companies taken over is, is done by the board of management or board of directors. Board of directors will not be able to exercise their power. So this everything is mentioned under section 15 of this act that how management would be run in such kind of cases. So this is one of the examples. So how, it, as we are discussing, this is a hot topic, that this is the SARPC and IVC being interplayed. So most of the SARPC's provisions are being effective in the liquidation because during CIRP, it is under the moratorium and cannot be enforced and cannot go simultaneously. This is section 13 four in which by taking the measures, you uh, realize the security interest. Now, there are one or two... Ma'am, uh, I'm so sorry to um, interrupt you because uh, I need to be clarified. So you mean to say that uh, uh, when uh, the uh, secured creditors has relinquished its assets to the pool, liquidation pool, mm. the uh, they cannot, uh, I mean, the liquid uh, liquidator cannot uh, take any action, I mean, available under surface, see? No, no, because in that case, the provisions of liquidation process okay. regulation of IBC will be applicable exclusively. Okay. So the manner of sale is regulation 32 of IBC, which says that you would sell as a going concern or in lots. If you would sell, then schedule one is provided. How would you decide the reserve price? How would valuation would be done? So uh, in case of IBC, if everything is in the pool of the liquidation estate, liquidator has to follow the provisions of the liquidation process regulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, if the secured creditor has taken over uh, or the possession under section 13, we had already discussed rule eight and nine. There are certain other rules which uh, sub rules of eight, which says that once the secured creditor takes over the position, it is having the duty to keep the secured asset 
under proper custody get the valuation done because that valuation is as in case of the ibc that valuation is used to decide the reserve price same as in the case of the surface if secure creditor decides to do so so this is with respect to the important provisions of section 13 section 14 which we were discussing section 14 is when for taking over the possession of the secured asset you are facing any obstruction then you would go to the district magistrate in metro city that may be called as cmm chief metropolitan magistrate section 14 is uh, giving you the ingredients that a secure creditor has to put in the affidavit before putting it to the DM seeking assistance. The judgment which I was uh, trying to refer at that point of time when we were discuss discussing section 14, the standard chartered bank versus Noble Kumar, which says that DM only and only is required to see two things. When any secured creditor comes to the DM for the assistance, then the only object is to give the speedier remedy. So DM only has to see two things and this should not dwell into anything more. Those two things is see whether the affidavit is having the nine clauses of section 14. And second, see the ter territorial jurisdiction. No other thing is to require to be seen by the DM. There is no adjudicating power with the DM. So DM is only see is, is only taking the application along with the affidavit. Affidavit would have has to have the nine clauses which is given under section 14. DM would see whether the section 14's requirement is there in the application. DM would see whether the property is coming under its territorial jurisdiction and then issue the appropriate direction for the administrative assistance but very important subsection of 14 which says that no act of chief metropolitan magistrate or district magistrate any officer authorized by a chief metropolitan magistrate or district magistrate done in pursuance of this section shall be called in question in any court or before any authority. This cannot be challenged. Whatever action is taken in pursuance of the order of the DM on the application made by the secured creditor seeking assistance cannot be challenged in any court. So this is uh, something which either has to be struck down or has some some remedy shall be given over there because it's very harsh provision is categorically is stating that there is no remedy available to the borrower to challenge the action which is taken pursuant to the order under section 14. Ma'am, is there any deeming provision? Suppose I have applied to CMM, uh, like uh, my application should be heard within a certain period of time? There is time period given, but there is no deeming provision, sir. I think it was in the air uh, of late. Within a period of 30 days from the date of application. So that should be construed as a... If, if, if within 30 days period, he is not able to give his uh, reason and if he is dealing, then when he passes the order after 30 days, he must state the reason of the delayed decision. But there is no deeming provision, sir. Okay. Yes. So I uh, had discussed already that when the secured creditor decides to take over the management under Section 13.4b, then the provision of Section 15 is applicable. So even if the administrator by the secured creditor has been appointed during the liquidation process under IBC, the provisions of Section 15 has to be met. Because you must remember this, that secured creditor is exercising its right under Sarpisi, not under IBC. If you are not relinquishing your right and you decide to realize your security interest outside the liquidation process under the Sarpisi Act, then you, has to, you have to follow the provisions of the Sarpisi Act. 
Now, Section 15, which gives the manner and effect of the takeover of management, has to be followed strictly by that secured creditor who is taking over the management. There is one more thing that I missed under 13.4b, sorry, under Section 13.4. I had mentioned four measures which secured creditor could take. So two were with respect to the taking over position. One was with respect to the taking over management. And th fourth is garnishi notice. What that garnishi notice is, recently I uh, 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 encountered a very interesting case, which was not interesting in the beginning, it's very normal, but see what happened. So Punjab National Bank is the secured creditor. The client is of Mumbai and uh, uh, had taken around 35, yeah, 25 crore as loan, had mortgaged his uh, property as secured interest. There is one uh, amendment or there is one requirement under the RBI guidelines. So if I have taken more than one facilities, I am being borrower one only, but I have taken four facilities from the one bank. And if I am defaulting, in one facility, it could be compositely put as NPA and the further action can be taken by the uh, uh, bank or secured creditor. So PNP issued 13-2 notice and that loan agreement was having a clause of arbitration. What PNB did, PNB filed Section 9 application under Arbitration Act. Is anyone having any knowledge of Section 9 of the Arbitration Act? Ma'am, taking interim, taking interim relief. Taking interim relief. Now, what PNB did, Section 9 was filed. My client being borrower was put as respondent number one. His wife's, wife was co-borrower, so respondent number two. Five other respondents, who were they? Uh, Reliance, IOGL, and uh, four more people who are the clients of my client. So my client is running a business. The customers, suppose one of the customers is ICL, IOGL. The customers of my client were put as the respondent party and the prayer was this, that no payment by the customers of my client be released to my client, but directly to the secured creditor. So PNB is saying that whatever is money whatever money is recoverable by the borrower from its customers should come directly to me, which I would adjust to the account of the borrower and it should not be released to the borrower. This is called garnishing. So the case which I was referring to in which the secured creditor took over the management of the JV project, they did one more thing. The government was uh, the project was government project as I had mentioned. The secured creditor was having security interest on the receivables. So what secured creditor did? They issued notice under section thirteen subsection four thirteen uh, uh, sorry thirteen four d which is garnishing to the government authority, saying that this project is being completed by the JV. On construction of the JV's project, you would be releasing on the running account bills. You would be making payment. These are the receivables for the JV, but I am the secured creditor. I am having the security interest on the receivable. So what you would do, I am issuing the notice to you. You will not make the payment to the JV, but you would make payment to me. That is called garnish. This is 13.4B, 13.4D. This is the fourth measure that I wanted to discuss about. So uh, in, in the case which I mentioned, the secure creditor took two measures under, under section 13.4. In fact, I would say three measures. They took the possession also of the movable property, symbolic possession. Second, they took the management also of the borrower and appointed as administrator. Third, they issued the garnishy order also because they were having the security interest on the receivables. Now, the case which we were discussing right now, the PNB, who filed Section 9. Before Section 9 could be listed, my client made the payment to the PNB. So, 
this is obligation on the secured creditor as soon as the payment is made the bank has to regularize or declassify the npa account and regularize the account but this the, my my client did so before the matter came to be listed so then when, when matter came to be listed pnb was required to mention this before the court that now i have received the amount the account can be regularized now uh, or pnb should have mentioned that i'm not pressing for this application anymore because now the account has been declassified but it chose not to do so and it mentioned that i want to carry on this application because i just want to ensure that the borrower keeps on paying in the future as well the client became very furious and client said that no this is not the way first you are issuing the or you are serving such kind of petition to my customers this is ultimately going to affect my livelihood because these are all government organizations from which i get the orders once such kind of applications or petitions are being served on my customers i'll stop receiving any order you are affecting my business directly so what should i do the client was decided or thought of going in the writ petition and challenge it saying that the action of the pnb is affecting my fundamental right of livelihood so uh, the pn the appropriate writ to be issued against the bank and it uh, has to reimburse the damages or loss that has incurred to me or is i have going to incur such losses or damages to the business because of this act of the bn pnb it was advised to not to file the writ petition because banking is a business which is providing financial assistance it's not an organization like bcci against whom a writ jurisdiction can be amenable so it was advised that if you could file the writ petition against the pnb even being psu public sector bank the business which is being carried on by the bank is of the financial assistance is a private business or is in the nature of the private business so writ jurisdiction will not be amenable better you calculate the loss or damages that you feel that you have incurred cause of the section of the bank and file a suit suit before the uh, civil court for the recovery of the loss or damages incurred so this is uh, a kind of proceeding which had recently happened but suit of injunction also maybe. suit of injunction but the harm had already because, uh, harm had already asking uh, be asking pnb not to issue such notices but that had already happened that had uh, the, the loss or the event had already taken place now your uh, plea is that you had incurred loss so compute your loss or the damages and then ask for the damages or recovery of the loss or damages the customers uh, sir your voice is breaking so ma'am the matter got settled or is it still pending sir is it still pending okay right now next is sir this um uh, if we see the next provision now comes the now comes the court drt application against the measures so the bank took measures under section 134 of the sarpc any person who is aggrieved by the measures any person again i am uh, why i am uh, uh, emphasizing on this word not necessarily be the borrower only any person who is aggrieved by the measure taken by the secured creditor under section 13 sub section 4 can file an application before the debt recovery tribunal within 45 days of the step taken by the secured creditor now if you recollect 
in ibc the application under section 60 subsection 5 or the appeal under section 61 the language there also starts with any person aggrieved with the order so any person means what do you mean by any person in ibc in the perspective of ibc i would ask what do you mean by any person If my rights are affected in any manner, being a third third party. Yes, being a third party. If your rights are being affected, that means you must be an aggrieved person. You cannot yes. be an XYZ person. Okay, so if if uh, any action or if the resolution plan is approved by the NCLT, you being the stakeholder, you are your right have been affected if, uh, with the approval of the resolution plan. So even when you were not the party before the NCLT, because when approval of plan application is moved before the NCLT, it is by this resolution professional. There may not be any other respondent party, but you could be an aggrieved party on the passing of the resolution plan. So any person who is aggrieved by the decision, including the borrower, that could be the, if the measure has been taken, borrower could be the aggrieved party. The most aggrieved party, which we see in the DRT proceeding is the tenants. So most of the proceedings or the litigations are uh, taken are, are being taken place by the tenants who are there in the uh, residing in the property, the position of which is uh, uh, taken over or proposed to be taken taken over by the secured creditor. So a special provision has come for thirteen four a. Now when then when the proceeding is filed before the DRT, which is termed as original application or securitization application uh, in the terminology if we say. So before DRT, the application goes before the registrar. Registrar, uh, as in any other court or tribunal, the registry first scrutinizes the application, brings out the defects, let you know what are the defect is, and give a number to your SA or OA as the case may be. Uh, classification of this terminology or the case number depends on, you know, bench to bench. So section 17 can be termed as original application, securitization application, number is given and a bench is allotted. So uh, uh, in Delhi, if there are DRT, three DRTs, the bench is allotted as per suppose uh, based on the uh, territorial jurisdiction as well. So, so if that uh, one project is... Uh, coming in the uh, area of Burari, uh, over where the secure creditor had gone to take over the position and any person aggrieved with that measure can go to the DRT. Maybe DRT3 is having the territorial jurisdiction and the registrar would allot the case in a particular bench. And then bench, as per section 17, subsection 3, would examine the facts and circumstances, take the evidences on record, and pass the order. It's, does, it does not have the exact power as a civil court has, like for the cross-examination or uh, 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 calling uh, on any of the parties on summons, uh, on third parties on summons. Of course, the parties, they would be called uh, by showing the notices. But the uh, powers which NCLT has as per the Companies Act is the power of civil uh, court as per section 420, if I'm not wrong, 420 or 422, in which the NCLT or NCLDT has been formed. Here in DRT, it says that the DRT, after examining the facts and circumstances of the case and evidence produced by the parties, comes to the conclusion that the measure referred to in subsection 4 of 13 taken by the secured creditor are not in accordance with the provision of this section and the rules made thereunder, then it would require the restoration of the management or restoration of the possession of the secured asset to the borrower and other aggrieved party. So if the DRT comes to the conclusion that process was not followed, process is given again under Rule 5, Rule 8, Rule 9 with respect to the movable, immovable property. So if the measure which was taken, but measure 13 to notice, no clear 60 days period was given, objection was not taken on record, or uh, it was rejected without reason. So you are having such kind of objections with which you can go to the DRT and file an application saying that the process which was, which was adopted by the 
a secured creditor was not in consonance with the provisions of the act and therefore it would be should be declared as a, uh, null and void and if it is so decided then the management if it was taken over it would be restored if the possession was taken over it was also to be restored to the borrower <coughs> there is one provision <coughs> which uh, talks about the compensation to the borrower so ma'am this ma'am this tenancy so they they, they are quite succeeded i mean uh, success I'm coming to that okay. I'm, I'm coming to that tenancy is the 17 subsection 4 so if if uh, any tenant is uh, uh, filing an application saying that his leasehold rights are being affected with the measures which is being taken uh, by the secured creditor, it can file an application and show that how its leasehold rights or tenancy rights are being affected. In that case, the DRT would examine the facts and would also see whether the tenancy rights was first created after the security interest was created in favor of the secured creditor. Whether the tenancy rights are having any such provision which is contrary to the provisions or uh, contrary to the clause of the mortgage deed. So, DRT would go into the clauses of the tenancy as well as of the secured interest in the favor of uh, secured creditor and then decide accordingly either in the favor of the tenant or in the favor of the secured creditor. So, that is, uh, this, this provision was brought into uh, by inserting this section of 30, sorry, uh, uh, 17.4a because this section was the most affected section. Uh, the section of the tenant uh, or the lease holders was the most affected parties and therefore this uh, 17.4a brought into the picture. Section 17 where DRT is giving any decision. So if any party is affected with the decision of DRT, then the appeal is filed with the DRA. But this is not very simple. Section 18 prescribes for the procedure for filing of the appeal before the DRAT. But it also puts on the borrower, not on any other person, it's very interestingly written over here. If the borrower wants to file any appeal, or any person who wants to file an appeal, they may have to uh, submit the fee. But with respect to the borrower, the fee would be the 75% of the debt. So for if, if the borrower wants to file an appeal against the order of the DRT before doing that, 75% of the debt amount will be submitted as fee, which can be reduced after consideration up to 25%. With respect to the other parties, it may be considered by the DRAT when it comes to the fee, but it's very harsh on the on the borrowers if they want to file their appeal. So it says that different fee may be prescribed for filing an appeal by the borrower or by the person other than the borrower. So there can be different fees. For the borrower, it can be different. For other parties, it would be different. Further, no appeal shall be entertained unless the borrower has deposited with the appellate tribunal 50% of the, sorry, not 75, 50% of the amount of debt due from him. As claimed by the secured creditors or determined by the DRT, whichever is less. And provided further that for reasons to be recorded in writing, this amount can be reduced not less than 25% of the debt. So the fees is a big burden on the borrowers and for filing this appeal, which starts for 50% can be reduced up to the uh, 25%. This fees, if I am correct, used to be 75%. Yes. Now it has come to 50 and which can be reduced not less than 25% of the debt amount. So this yeah. is a big... Uh, yeah, this has so been reduced to 50% in 2004. Into the amendment. Yes. So first it was 75% reduced to 50% and then it came to the 25%, right? So this is the uh, DR80. Further, if can anyone tell me what uh, identical provision 
section is there in the insolvency code? Identical. We'll have to check. That means you mean to say that uh, that uh, NCLT has got a uh, civil power, I mean, civil court power? No, no. I am 79. Section 34 of the SARPC says that if uh, the issues on which DRT or DRAT is having the jurisdiction for which civil court will not have any jurisdiction. So if DRT and DRAT has been given any jurisdiction under SARPC. Only DRT and DRAT are eligible to consider the jurisdiction, exercise the jurisdiction. Civil court is having no jurisdiction on the issues uh, of the SARPC. There is one identical provision under the IVC. What that provision is? It's 60 or 62 or something, you know, uh, near around section 60. Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, it will be the jurisdiction will be with NCLT, NCLT, uh, the adjudicating authority. Yes. So section is 61 is appeal to the NCLT, 62 is appeal to the Supreme Court, 63. Civil court not to have jurisdiction. That no civil court or authority shall have jurisdiction to entertain any suit or proceedings in respect of any manner on which NCLT or NCLAT has jurisdiction under this code, civil court not to have jurisdiction. So this is identical provision under IBC. Section 35, which says overriding effect of the act. What is identical provision under IBC? 238. 238. But 230, so uh, if we uh, understand with the common uh, law, the act which comes into effect later has the overriding effect on the previous law. The IBC says that any contrary, uh, the, the provisions of any other law which is contrary to the provisions of IBC, then IBC would prevail. In Sarfesi, I had already mentioned this Supreme Court judgment uh, of the Indian Overseas Bank where the Supreme Court had held that IBC would having would be having the overriding effect over of the SARPC. Uh, and therefore, the moratorium was given effect to. See, similar provision is with respect to the SARPC because at that point of time, RDDB Act, which is now repealed, was also into the effect and there were certain other uh, 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 special acts for the recovery of the debts. So SARPC was given the overriding effect over those acts. With this one, I have already explained that banks are not amenable to the rich jurisdiction. When was now, the, the, the recent done? judgment by Justice M.R. Shah, which says that uh, in case of surface, hmm. a rich, rich jurisdiction cannot be invoked by the borrowers. Hmm. Because there is appellate, uh, there is appeal provided under the surface. And there's a recent judgment, I think, three, four days back, it has come. It, it, it is very recent one. I yeah. had also, one second, I downloaded as well. One second, if I am having Hindi. Yeah. Yeah. Ramas, uh, I think. Ramdas, the, no, 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 sorry. Not Ramdas, the question, no, Indian number says. What you are saying is this. It's very recent, uh, uh, which says that because under the surface, you are already having alternative remedy available against the yes. of the DRT. Yes. So you can go to the DRAT. You cannot directly go to the red jurisdiction. Yes. And his judgment was very aggressive to say that SARPC has been created with the objective for the uh, 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 speedy uh, recovery. So by going into the red jurisdiction borrower, this is a tactic of you know delaying the proceeding. Yeah. So yeah. he was very aggressive in his, in this his recent order. You are very right. It has come very recently, three four days back only. Yeah, that's the so, that's the nature of Justice Sa because he is very he has come very yes Big very heavily. Yeah, you know. uh, yes yes he has come very heavily on this as uh, all uh, delay tactics right. So I what, had, is, the, what is the citation, ma'am? Emma, if you would, uh, I had only it. came recently, I think three, four three days, days back. back only. I Once I am it. having it, or either I am having the live law uh, uh, citation. Yeah, I am also. 
Mr. Atul, do you have any reference of that? Like your citation? Yeah, I can, I can circulate in the chat box after I get, get the citation. When was the RDTB repealed, ma'am? I would have to check the date, but it, uh, I'm not handy with the dates, sir. I'm so sorry. I can come back to you on this later. So this is uh, 19th April. Yeah. Shah's order that uh, Supreme Court Depri case High Court entertaining writ petition in RPC matters thrown upon borrowers approaching High Courts to consider offers to bank. So this is uh, comprising of also ju Justice Sanjeev Khanna and uh, Justice M.M. Sundresh. Yeah, three bench judgment. Messer South Indian Bank, Naveen Matthew Phillips, and another. Come again, madam. Uh, this is uh, South Indian Bank Limited and others versus Naveen Matthew Phillips and another. Okay. So, ma'am, with RDDB, repeat, now DRT. Uh, probably will uh, lose the entity or what? they will still continue. Sorry, I, I couldn't get it. With you, so DRT, DRT has been constituted under DRT Act and DRT is the authority only under SARPC to take uh, the uh, jurisdiction of the cases under SARPC. Okay. Yes. I don't think that we are having any group made for this session. So what I can do is I have already downloaded the judgment. I can send it to Miss Nikita. Madam, please share this PPT also to uh, Miss Nikita. This is simply a word, a document I'll share with uh, her. Yes. And yes. ma'am, there is one more judgment which has recently come. This is regarding treatment of rights of a secured creditor who mm. not who would not fall under the category of either a financial creditor or operational creditor. Hmm. And this is a judgment in Vistra ITCL Limited versus Dinkar Venkat Subramanium. Hmm. This is a Supreme Court judgment. Right. So basically, this judgment deals with the rights, treatment of rights of secure creditor who would not who be not financial creditor or, or operational creditor under IBC. So basically, that would also again come under the ambit of surface. Because under the surface, the, he would be a secure creditor. Secure creditor who are banking uh, uh, institutions, financial institutions, uh, ARCs. So yeah. all secure creditors, but the secure creditors who are defined under the surface CA. Yes. yes, yes. Ma'am, suppose like, you know, uh, in my individual capacity or say like, you know, I'm a corporate and I'm given, uh, I mean, uh, what do you call loans to uh, and that has been secured by way of mortgage. So can I can I be treated as a uh, secured financial creditor? You are the secured financial creditor, no doubt in that. But the uh, remedy available under surface is not for you because you are an individual lender. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, uh, what you can do is initiate the proceedings under Transfer of Property Act. You can go under the civil court. Uh, uh, jurisdiction or you can initiate the IVCPR meeting yes. is sold. And also commercial courts. Now commercial courts for the summary proceedings. Yes. So these uh, 138 if, if, if the uh, uh, has been sold. Yes. 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 So NIA provisions would also come if there were checks were given and they are bounced. So this is I, I try to uh, formulate one uh, sheet with respect to the compliances, which uh, may be if uh, uh, of any help of, for you, then I can also circulate this along with this, my document. Max, you're really going to help us. Yes, so what I have done that, how, uh, which section to be read with which rule and what are the requirements at what stages. So if you are suppose point number one, bank or financial institution, every bank is internally is authorizing its authorized officer. So there are ranks given in the banks, internal management, and not every person can go and take over the uh, uh, position of the asset. So every person whosoever is authorized by that bank. 
would have to do then and that person has to have a proper power of attorney uh, which is also required under uh, section 13 sub section 12 read with rule 2a demand notice i had already mentioned section 13 to relevant rule is to be of the security enforcement then notice can be how how would you be sending the notice the uh, process is already given over there and if borrower is avoiding any notice, then sh service shall be made by affixing the notice. Mr. Mauto, you had asked this question. Mm -hmm. So the relevant rule is given, rule 3.1. So you would also be giving the substituted service, which, which we say by uh, issuing the notice in the newspaper. And if there are more than one borrower, which includes the guarantor, that individually everyone has to be served. This is, uh, so if you ever see 13 to notice, it gives in the beginning, it gives in blocks the name of each and every person and each and every person is served individually. So in any case, a reply or representations are received by the bank, then it has to be adjudicated and decided by the bank. That is 13.3 year I had already mentioned. 13.4 is the uh, uh, measure that we discussed that can be taken. That is symbolic possession. This is uh, rule 5C takes symbolic position of the secured asset if it is uh, a movable asset. File an application with CM or DM for taking actual possession of the property if you are seeking seeing any disturb disturbance for recovering or to having the possession of the property. Comply with the order of CM or DM, section 14.2. Um, these are just some checklists that you can take list of. After taking over the possession, notice will have to be affixed as per Rule 8. This is with respect to the movable, uh, sorry, immovable property. Again, with respect to immovable property, once you take the possession within seven days, you have to publish a newspaper. Two, uh, one is the vernacular language and one, another one would be the leading newspaper. It has to display on the property 8.1. Insurance is required to be managed because you would be under the uh, obligation to have the proper custody of the asset. So that would include the security as well as the insurance cover. Uh, take photographs just to keep your inventory and your record clear. Security guards, you will have to uh, deploy valuation and requires to be done as per 8.5. Uh, notice for the, to the borrower, yes. Before putting the property on sale, a 30 days notice is required to be given to the borrower a clear 30 days notice. Now, suppose that auction happens and no one uh, uh, comes in the auction. There is no party who appears in the auction. Then second auction would take place. For second auction, the period of notice uh, is only 15 days. But for the first auction, the period of notice is 30 days to the borrower. Uh, Ma'am, uh, for this 15, uh, clause number 15, Security guards to be deployed. Uh, I mean, even for going for a residential flat, I need to keep a security guard over there to safeguard my interest. Eight four would be because it is this. You have to ensure the custody. So how do you ensure the custody is up to you? But eight four says that you would have to uh, 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 take the measures to protect the security interest. It's the same as you do as RP or the liquidator in your uh, cases. But if I read 8.4 to be specific, let us read 8.4. In 8.4, the authorized officer shall take steps for preservation and protection of the secured asset and ensure them if necessary till they are sold or otherwise disposed of. So if you see that there is requirement of the security interest, by putting the or deploying the secured uh, personnel, then you must take this step. Uh, it is barely seen for all residential flats. So for factory, one can understand the security yeah. guards he deployed. So take any step with, with which you can justify that you could take all the measure for the prevention and protection of the property. So that's more important than how do you do that. Madam, I have you a can the CCTV cameras that you, you can also show that you are taking this step for the protection. Madam, I have a doubt. Uh, for taking symbolic uh, possession, 45 days time uh, is allowed for the opposite party to approach uh, under Section 17. So that being the case uh, for a sale, you say 30 days. So mm -hmm. the, that 30 days will be in addition to 45 days. That is, uh, the bank has to wait for 45 days 
and see if there is uh, any action, uh, rather any application is preferred under Section 17. If not, then only go for uh, sale or respective of the same within the 45 days time, once uh, symbolic possession is taken, can they straight away proceed uh, for sale action and uh, give notice of 30 days? Whether it is 45 plus 30 or, uh, you know, this is standalone. That's my question. So if, if I could understand your question, you are saying that if symbolic position is taken, not physical position, but if symbolic position is taken, it is also a measure against which a grieved person can... No, no. The crux of the thing is, what, 45 days time is given under Section 17. Yes, for, for against measure the taken by secure creditor. Yeah, yes. once, once 13 four is initiated, 45 days time is given. So, uh, is this 30 day has to be reckoned uh, uh, further to 45 days or the moment the uh, possession is taken, the bank can proceed with the sale. Has the other uh, opposite party be given 45 days time to see whether if he has grievance and if so, uh, to approach the DRT or the bank has not at all to wait, can stay once taken possession, whether symbolic or actual, can straight away go proceed with sale and then issue notice for 30 days. Am I clear? I got your point. I'm just uh, checking one thing to answer. I, I understood your point that when section 17 is providing 45 days, but after position, <laughs> symbolic position, if you can see just within 30 days, then it would be 45 plus 30 or it still it would be <laughs> 35 only. Exactly. Sorry, 45 exactly. That's just but there is one thing that I want to check. Just give me a moment. <clears throat> <coughs> this is <coughs> hmm. So, subrule 5 per says that before effecting sale of the immovable property referred to in subrule 1 or 9, the authorized officer shall obtain the valuation of the property from an approved valuer and in consultation with the secured creditor fixed a reserve price and may sell the whole or any part of the immovable property a secured asset by way of any of the following methods. The authorized officer shall serve to the borrower a notice of 30 days for sale of the immovable property secured asset under subrule 5, provided that if the sale of such secured asset is being affected by either inviting tenders or holding public auction, secured creditor shall cause a public notice in two newspapers of so-and-so having circulation giving so-and-so detail. Every notice of sale shall be affixed on the part of the immovable property sale by any method of so-and-so. Sir, what I understand is that Possession of the immovable property uh, would be taken post that its valuation and everything. I think it would be from the date of from the date of symbolic possession. You uh, would go to the and uh, DRT for challenging that. This is the one cause of action. First, you if you receive the symbolic possession uh, notice, which is uh, pasted on the property. Yeah. From that, within 45 days, you have one cause of action to approach the DRT. Section 17. Section 17. Second, the notice for the sale of the property, movable property, is the different cause of action. Oh, I see. That is okay, so which is happening, which is happening after the secure so, creditor takes over so, position, getting the valuation from the done. the bank's perspective, uh, they, it doesn't prevent the bank from straight away proceeding with sale uh, initiatives once they take sim symbolic position. They don't symbolic have to wait for the for taken, 45 taken. days. Right. They don't have to wait for the 45 days period to expire. Directly go to the DRT because as you are very right and I mentioned in the beginning also, once you take the symbolic position, you can directly move for the auction sale. Of course, by giving the 30 days notice. So that symbolic position and if the bank is directly going for the sale as well, bank would have to still give 30 days notice for the sale. So when they are taking symbolic possession, you may choose to directly challenge that. And if you receive the notice of 30 days for the sale, you can still go to the DRT within that 45 days. So these both are giving you an action because both are is being taken as a measure under section 13.4 for realization of the security interest. Uh, Madam, somewhere you mentioned that 13.4 uh, 
uh, once notice is issued within seven days, say, this is also to be given in the paper publication. Yes, within seven so, days. Yes. Which is that uh, rule, madam? Because in a it particular case, rule uh, eight two. Eight two. I see. Oh, it is. It says days. that the possession notice is referred to in sub rule one shall also be published as soon as possible, but in any case not later than seven days from the date of taking possession in two leading newspaper. One in vernacular and second is having a sufficient circular. Right. Thank, thank you, thank you, madam. Uh, that forty-five days is counted from the date of uh, thirteen two notice. From the date of the measure taken under under thirteen four, it, it says 13, measure thirteen two notice. Well, it says that forty-five days from the date of uh, thirteen two notice. Within thirty, sorry, within forty-five days from the date on which such measure had been taken. So its measure is under thirteen four, sir. Okay. If you would read seventeen subsection one, it says any person aggrieved by any of the measure referred under thirteen four taken by the secured creditor, then an application along with fee may be moved to the DRT having jurisdiction within forty-five days of. Such measure to taken by the secured creditor. So it is from 13.4, not 13.2. You are having no remedy against 13.2 except giving your representation under 13.3a. Okay. These are the rules under the Sarkis Act, ma'am? Yes, these are the rules uh, framed. Uh, these are called as security interest enforcement rules of 2002. This has to be. Uh, read along with the uh, sections because the process and the manner in which the security interest can be enforced is given under the rules. So any uh, variation by the secured creditor uh, from the rules, any distraction than it, uh, the corporate, uh, sorry, the borrower would be having the objection and they can go to the DRT with those grounds. So you would have to strictly follow these rules. So these rules I have uh, given the, in this tabular form. <clears throat> and we had already actually discussed most, most of the things while discussing the substantive provision of the law. And um, this also we have discussed application, then appeal, disposal, The period is given 180 days for DRTs to dispose the matter, but nowadays a date is given for six months. So next date of hearing comes only after six months. So we the DRTs are under very bad infrastructure. And as we are seeing in the NCLTs as well, though in NCLT time to time, some recruitments keep happening, but DRT is facing too much of uh, a pressure of the work. Yeah, recently the Delhi High Court, Justice uh, Najmi Wajiri, in fact, has summoned uh, the government officials also for providing proper infrastructure and also VC facility for hearings and all, so that it can be done in a timely manner. Because a lot of money is stuck there in DRT for recovery. You know. Right. Ma'am, can any other professional other than lawyer can practice in DRT? Uh, no, sir. It's advocate only or the party in person. I am not sure about CS and CMAs and chartered accountants in person as a, uh, how do I say, authorized representative can appear there. Because they are termed as tribunal. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I would request if you are interested, as you remember in IBC, we are having Swiss ribbon or innovative case as our Bible. You can read Mardia chemicals for the Sarfesi Act if you want to understand the procedure, the Sarfesi, because the constitutionality of the Sarfesi was challenged under uh, this uh, particular uh, case. So here the uh, Supreme Court had upheld the constitutionality of the Sarfesi. So please go through this. This judgment is equivalent to what we have in, as innovative and Swiss ribbon in the or SR in the case of IBC. Some two or more judgments that I have mentioned over here um, that may not be that relevant to remember, but if you just want to have 
uh, locate it. I'll circulate this Word document with you. I would say that I think we had discussed quite, um, which I could understand that we have the interplay with the IBC, the provisions of the scheme of the SARPC Act. Is this only the main chapter? Is chapter number two, chapter number three is with respect to the registrations of the ARC. Chapter number four is the SARSI, uh, where the uh, security interests are uh, registered. In the case of company, it would be the companies that otherwise SARSI is also for the secure creditors um, uh, uh, to register their security interest. And uh, then offenses and penalties is uh, chapter number five. If you just want to have a look at it, you may. Miscellaneous provision we had already discussed, like that is section 34, which I had mentioned, 35, overriding effect. Um, limitation period is applicable under surface as per section 36. Power of central government to frame rules, which, which we had already read, the rules which is uh, there. And uh, this is a small, very uh, small act having section 42 only, you just also can have a look at the Bayer Act as and when you get time, I'll circulate this note to you. And can you uh, circulate your contact details along with the PPT? Yes, sure. I can just right now put on the chat box. Or you can do it in the PPT only. Your I'll, firm, I'll do that. That firm's would be more appropriate. I'll do that. Firm's I'll give details, you. Your firm's details and all. Sure, sure. I'll put that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, Nikita, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, one last question. I mean, clarification. Yes, See, uh, so far as the ARCs are concerned, I think they have been given, uh, I mean, they've been allowed to take over the company and participate in CRP in the capacity of resolution applicant by, by the RBI? No, uh, sir, to my knowledge, because I have been pursuing this, uh, following this, uh, uh, this uh, litigation of the RBA has uh, recently stipulated a minimum net worth of uh, uh, say yes. 1000 crore or something so that they can be a resolution applicant. Then in that case, sir, then this uh, litigation of UVRCL would become infructuous. Yeah, because I also read somewhere that now the ARCs have been That's allowed. The RBA is the only. But the, the, this particular litigation was listed in the month of May, I think 1st or 2nd May only. And uh, now the next date of hearing has been given July. Uh, no okay. such submissions have been made post, you know, this this, this uh, litigation is going on since 2020 or 21. And RBA circulars, if that is very recent, it could have been mentioned in the recent hearing of the May. I would also have uh, located and uh, uh, let us see. I mean, I, I can get back to you on this if I am having any view. Uh, no, very limited ARCs only have uh, the minimum of the RBI. may not be in the world. Right, sir. Yeah, there was some judgment on the definition of 29A, who, who could be resolution applicant and all that. Think, uh, so this, the, the main submission, I would along with this, uh, share the first order in this case. The main submission by the UVRCL was this, that 29A is not barring me. Yeah. 29A is only uh, giving the disqualification in which I'm not falling into. So you yes. can restrict me for part yes. of the resolution plan. Now, if RBI to cover that up has come with the net worth requirement of the ARC, then it's a different question altogether. <laughs> because there's an explanation uh, which is attached. Net worth was 100 crores, I think, for registration of ARCs. It was earlier. Those what what I believe, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. I think Mr. Mathu mentioned about it. Uh, the recent development they are saying that RBA has come with the recent notification increasing the net worth for submitting the resolution plan. But I believe that would not be the only uh, amendment that RBA would have come into because RBI had also given the area of business that ARC aid can do. So RBI must have also defined the nature of business or must have amended the nature of business which the ARC can get into because this RPC Act de defines the area of business for the ARCs. So if there is this amendment of the RBI, it has to be 
you know, on this aspect as well. It cannot only be on the net worth criteria. That's my personal opinion because... Yeah, if, if you can look at explanation two, which is there in section 29A, it says that for the purposes of this section, financial entity shall mean the following entities. And it includes asset ARCs registered with the RBI uh, under section three of Surface Act. Hmm. So 29A is allowing them. Yeah, allowing them. So, uh, and it only says that uh, a central government may in consultation with the financial regulator notify in this behalf. So there is some catch there, but otherwise ARC is allowed. Yes. And, uh, and that is their argument that because 29A does not bar us and allow us, the RBI could not issue the uh, show cause notice. You were reading explanation D. An asset reconstruction company registered with the yeah. RBI under section 3 of SARPC. Explanation yeah, 2 says that financial entity shall mean such and such. For the purposes of this section, financial entity shall mean the following entities which meet the criteria or conditions as the central government may in consultation with the financial sector regulator notify in this behalf, namely so and so, and one of it is ARCs. Yeah, it's the enabling provision which is there already. So right. they are not restricted as such. The only thing that some criteria would be there. Hmm. Correct, sir. RBA circular of 10th October 2022 hmm. that if ARC wants to be a resolution applicant, their minimum net worth should be 1000 crores. And that's the only uh, requirement, sir? How, or, how many crores, sir? 1000 crores minimum net worth. 1000 crores, my God. That's yeah. too, too high. Yeah. To register ARC minimum 100 crores, that uh, up to March 2024, Otherwise, it will be 200 crores. And uh, before March 2026, the minimum net worth will be 300 crores for getting an ARC license. Sir, uh, which date did you mention? It's 10th of October? But I see uh, 12th of October, uh, it came in all the papers. Maybe okay. one or two days before. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. I'll also look into it. Then, um, Thank you so much for uh, having this patient hearing and making this session interactive. And I really enjoyed uh, taking this se session. I believe uh, I may get the opportunity again. And thank you so much, Nikita, for giving me this opportunity to uh, give this uh, small presentation. Nikita, I'm leaving it uh, over you. Are you yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this interactive session. And I'm really glad that you have agreed to take the session. And I hope all the participants also like the session. And thank you so much to the participants also for making it a success. Thank you so thank much, Lee. Thank you so much. Thank and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you I'll circulate my work note. Thank yeah. you. Sure, ma'am. I'll share. And uh, the participants, we will rejoin after one hour, like uh, the next session will start around two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. What time do you have to join? Yeah. Sir, we'll join around two. Okay, the next session will start at two. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nitika, do we need to lodge, uh, record our presence or something? Uh, something on no, the chat? No, sir, board? that is not required. Just on the display name, write your full name. That is sufficient. Ah, that is already there in my case. Yes, sir, that's it. Okay, fine. Then, then that's okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so the topic of today's session is interplay of IBC with arbitration and conciliation. So for this, we have Mr. Manish Paliwal, sir. Uh, he is an advocate on record in the Supreme Court of India, a registered IP and a fellow of the CLARB. He has rich experience in dispute resolution, including mediation, arbitration, and litigation. He has a lot of experience in representing the cases in both contentious and non-contentious cases in courses and tribunals across India, including the Supreme Court, High Court, NCLT, and CLADS. He has a lot of published judgments on the wide range of topics. Since 2006, he has worked in the areas of arbitration, corporate law, bankruptcy and insolvency, banking, real estate, intellectual property, cyber law, administrative law, consumer and competition law, etc. So over to you, sir, you may start the session. You're not audible, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Nikita ji, for an introduction. And uh, there, is, there is an esteemed gathering and a lot of people are there. And thanks to Rajkumar ji and Anil ji to switch on, uh, to keep their camera switched on. Because it gives me an impression that actually I'm speaking to the people. Thanks, Atul ji. So I request anybody who is in a position to switch on the camera, please switch it on. I wish to keep this session the as much interactive as possible. Because it's, it's, it's a practical aspect. And it is a less used tool in the hands of the insolvency professionals, which can be utilized. There are many tools which are overutilized. There are underutilized. It falls in the category of the underutilized tools. So when it comes to uh, arbitration, then the first question which normally strikes in the mind of insolvency professionals is section 14. Once we have section 14, as soon as the person is appointed as an IRP, all the recovery proceedings comes to a standstill. And if the recovery proceedings are coming to a standstill, what is the reason or a logic of learning arbitration in between? So, I will try to cover up those aspects and where it can be used and it cannot be used. Mm. So, to start with the session, I wish to point out that originally this law was developed long back. And it was one of the, arbitration is the one of the first means of resolving the dispute. So when the people start describing arbitration, they go back to the period of the Mahabharata and everything where they say that the Krishna, Lord Krishna was the first arbitrator in the mythology to say that he arbitrated between the Korvas and Pandvas and ultimately whatever happened, everybody knows, but he was one of the first arbitrator. How it is relevant and what is an arbitration? Arbitration is basically a tool of resolving the dispute between the two parties where the judge is appointed of their choice. So normally when you go to the adjudication before a courtroom, then a simple thing happens. The government has somebody in the place who decides the dispute in accordance with the law. That is what the role of a judge in a typical setting works. He takes the evidence, he reads the law, he hears the argument and then decides the case. In arbitration, this particular person is appointed by the wishes of the parties. So if the two parties agree to say that we want our dispute to be decided in accordance of law by this person, then it is called arbitration because then it is not a state funded mechanism. It is a parties funded mechanism where dispute between the two people are decided. Uh, just a second, sir. Uh, I'll, I'll take a short uh, call. Uh,
sorry sorry for the interruption so in this case what happens that the parties fund the resolution of the dispute and i would like to keep this session most interactive so what will happen that whatever questions you have you can put straight forwardly and i try to answer those questions to best of my capabilities if i'm not able to answer then i will drop a message of my email and phone number so you can ask anytime later on yes so arbitration is not bound by the procedure second thing which is distinguishing feature between an arbitration and a court mechanism normally when you go to the court you are bound by the mechanism provided in the civil procedure code or a criminal procedure code in the criminal cases but arbitration is applicable only to the mostly the civil cases so you are bound by a particular procedure and there is a certain timeline and a certain way it has to be done in case of arbitration what happens is that the parties have the freedom to choose the procedure we are going like step by step ahead in the arbitration thing but before that i want to resolve the query of the section 14 section 14 as soon as a company is admitted in the insolvency there is a moratorium moratorium says that no recovery proceedings can proceed against the corporate debtor arbitration is a proceedings in which dispute is decided and there could be recoveries against the corporate debtor so why we are reading the arbitration for a simple reason section 14 prohibits recovery against the corporate debtor but not by the corporate debtor so in all those cases where the corporate debtor is a claimant the arbitration proceedings can go ahead if there is a, some victory or some recovery during the cirp or even during the liquidation then those funds can be utilized by the insolvency professional resolution professional to pay off the debts in accordance with the mechanism prescribed in the waterfall mechanism in section 53 that's the reason number one the reason number two is that when a company is doing a business it obviously has creditors as well as debtors it's doing business means it might be providing services selling goods or doing something for some other parties so there are numerous recoveries to be made as soon as the company is admitted in the insolvency the people forget about those recoveries for multiple reasons one of the reason is that the court proceedings takes endless period of time like maybe one year two year three year five years and there are appeals provided in the first appeal and then second statutory appeal and then the supreme court the during the tenure of the resolution professional those proceedings might not attain finality so resolution professionals do not take the call to proceed against those recoveries for this simple reason one two cost implication so there is a huge cost implication somebody is filing in the court then he is supposed to pay the court fees and hire a lawyer and there is no recoveries so therefore the resolution professional feels that let it be say as that is let, let's not think about that there are many other things which i have to deal with so those things goes into the back the back side another reason is there is a less of awareness that how this tool can be utilized by the resolution professional during the CIRP. And because of these reasons, even after Section 14 moratorium has started, very few resolution professionals take help of the arbitration. In order to uh, go for the arbitration, oh, I, 
Uh, I think I should run the slides as well because some people might be taking notes. Just a second, give me. I have prepared the slides. Uh, so I'll just share with them. Uh, could you see the slides? Anybody can say yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So That's basically, the topic, topic is interplay of arbitration and conciliation act and insolvency proceedings. I just forgot in the, I was just returning from the courtrooms and then I forgot that I have prepared the slides for you people. Uh, yes. So first thing I wish to point out why the people use arbitration and why there is an additional factor to be considered. One of the, so we will go logically slide by slide. So there are 57 slides and I think we will be able to cover all in the presentation. One of the first and the foremost reason of using the arbitration over the court process is in some of the cases is that arbitration is universal. Why it is universal? Because there was a unicentral conciliation rule or United Nations formulated draft code. In this code, what has happened that multiple people became signatory to New York Convention. There are two conventions in the arbitrations. One is the Geneva Convention and another is New York Convention. Most of the countries in the world are signatory to those conventions. By virtue of signing those conventions, these countries make the awards enforceable in their domestic jurisdiction. So what happens is that if one party is located in India, it is doing business with somebody located in USA. There is a dispute between the two. If somebody goes to an Indian court and obtain a degree, then it is really difficult for him to get this degree enforced in USA. There is a long procedure, it's a time consuming and it's not economical at all. In contrast to this, if there is an arbitration agreement between the parties, and there is an award in the favor of one of the parties, that award can automatically be enforced in India as well as USA. So over the litigation, arbitration has an advantage to say that arbitration awards in accordance with the New York and the Geneva Convention are enforceable across the world, leaving few jurisdiction which Nobody does the business, but most of the countries who are trading with the others in a significant manner are signatory to this convention. So this is one of the additional grounds to have an arbitration agreement and recourse to the arbitration in comparison with the court. Sir, uh, you explain uh, uh, like, you know, the difference between these two conventions. Why there was a need of like you know going for two conventions rather than having a 
uh, in Sitral? So the, the first was the Geneva Convention and the second is the New York Convention. There are difference between the signatory and there are some variation in how the awards are enforced. So that's a little bit more minute. I think if we go into that issue, it will again take a lot of time. We can discuss it after the presentation. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So that's a very good question. It goes into the heart of it, but that that takes us into a different direction. And it's a bit more time consuming. But thanks for the question, Rajkumarji. I'll get back to you after the presentation on this. So second thing is how the parties go to arbitration. So in order to go to arbitration, there has to be an arbitration agreement between the parties. What is the arbitration agreement has been defined in section 7 of the Arbitration Act. Why there is a necessity of an arbitration agreement? Because the arbitrator derives its power by virtue of the agreement between the parties. So, when we contrast it with the court system, when we contrast with the system, the normally what happens is that the judge derives his power because he is appointed by the government. Uh, he is the one who is uh, have the power under the CPC, CRPC, everything. So where does the power of the arbitrators come? So it comes from the agreement between the parties where the parties says that we want to get this dispute decided by way of arbitration. So that's the power and therefore it is mandatory to have an agreement between the parties. So one of the question which arises is whether like if it is a mandatory requirement, then why and how this agreement should happen, whether it should be a formal agreement or whether it should be a part of it. So section seven is very much clear. Section seven agreement between the parties to arbitrate the dispute between the two parties can be in any form. If one party writes an email that I want to decide this dispute by an arbitration and other party consent, it becomes an arbitration agreement. If there is a clause in the agreement that if any dispute arise out of this agreement, then it is also an arbitration agreement. So the importance of the agreement is that it gives the jurisdiction to the arbitrator. It defines the scope what the arbitrator can do. So in an agreement, you can agree with a party that no interest will be payable to the winning party. In the agreement of arbitration, you can define that only this kind of dispute can be decided by way of an arbitration. Or only a claim which is more than of this value can be decided by the arbitration. In an arbitration agreement, you can decide that there can be three arbitrators. Five. One. So it gives the party complete autonomy to decide and choose how and in what manner they want to get their dispute decided. So that's what the importance of the agreement in the arbitration. So one of the first thing when an insolvency professional becomes an interim resolution professional or a resolution professional or liquidator, whatever in the capacity he is, to scrutinize the record of the company and find out in how many cases they have an arbitration agreement. Because there, there, there are lots of cases in which the X file management does not give any data. That's a general problem. But there are many cases in which in each agreement, the companies have inserted arbitration clauses for some reason. So it is important to find out what those clauses are, how they will operate, and how the resolution professional can use that mechanism of arbitration to his advantage to protect the interest of the stakeholders in the corporate debtor. I hope I'm clear. Any doubts so far? 
or yes, sir, uh, sir, suppose uh, during the course of like, you know, work order, mm -hmm. uh, when the order has been awarded, mm -hmm. somewhere like, you know, it has been mentioned that, okay, the target, this, uh, any dispute will be decided by arbitrator, just made a reference. Mm -hmm. Not a detailed any agreement like you know who should be the arbitrator and all. Uh, so like you know, how then like suppose there is a dispute then how should that matter uh, I mean go? It will be of course like you know go to go to the court for appointment of first and foremost thing is like you know we have to go to the court for appointment of a uh, arbitrator. If there is uh, an arbitration agreement, you have to look for further few things. One whether it provides a mechanism for appointment or not. If it provides the mechanism for appointment, then that mechanism is to be followed. If there is no mechanism, just a passing reference to say that dispute between the parties will be decided in accordance with the uh, Arbitration Act 1996, and there is no other reference. Okay. In that case, in subsequent to the slide, I will show there will be a section which is called Section 11 where the parties will approach to the High Court. Right now, this jurisdiction is given to the High Court and High Court will appoint this arbitrator. The and next... In, ca in case of international arbitration, mm -hmm. when one of, the, one of the party is a foreign party, then it would be Supreme Court, I believe. Right, sir. So, the domestic arbitration will go to the High Court. The international arbitration will go to the Supreme Court. Under 11.6. Right, sir. And one more thing mm -hmm. uh, regarding this, uh, as you mentioned, that the exchange of mail, etc., mm -hmm. regarding appointment of, uh, regarding arbitration clause. Mm -hmm. Now, after an end global decision of Supreme Court, mm -hmm. now unless until the general time paper, uh, that arbitration clause will not be valid clause. Ah. Uh... Your observation is valid, but there is a slight catch in that observation. So this particular controversy of stamping was going on since very long period of time and it is not something new. So there, what happens is that when there is a section in the Stamp Act which says if a document is produced before any authority who is competent to receive that document or take evidence or whatever it is, if it is not properly stamped, then he has the duty to impound it and send it to the collector of stamps. So assuming that you have an agreement, which is, a, which is requires to be on a stamp paper <coughs> and it has not been properly stamped. In that case, in that case, what happens is, uh, just a second. In that case, the arbitrator will impound the document or even the court can impound the document, send it to the collector. Collector will adjudicate that how much stamp duty is deficient with penalty. Once you pay the penalty, the agreement comes into the force and it will work like that. So even before this decision, this process used to be followed in all the cases. So typically in a civil case, suppose there is an agreement to arbitration or a normal agreement then and it has not been properly stamped say that the stamp duty is payable like 5 lakhs and one has paid like 500 rupees so whether that agreement become void no deficiency of the stamp duty does not invalidate the document it creates an embargo that that document can be cannot be used in the evidence and if you want to make use of that document you have to pay the proper stamp duty with the penalty, whatever is applicable. So the agreement itself will not become invalid. But yes, if somebody has not done even after that, then the question of the validity of that arbitration will be raised by some of the parties. So that's how the mechanism will work. Hope I'm clear, sir. Any other doubt on this issue, sir? No, actually, I was asking in the context of this re recent Supreme Court judgment in NN mm -hmm. Global, where they have said that if it is unstamped, then it is void. It is a void document. It can't be updated upon. Uh, with due respect, you, sh uh, you should read it once more. It doesn't say it's void. Uh, I have read that, like, uh, I have been 
citing those judgments. Yeah, but that position, come. that position was there also earlier. If a document which is required to be stamped is not stamped, then it it was to be impounded, and with penalty, it would have been acted upon. That was the position. Right. So that position is there. That position still exists. The only controversy there was a Garware judgment before this one, yeah. and there was referred by Justice Chandrachur to a larger bench to decide this issue, which has been decided by the majority of the three two. So there is yeah. a split verdict. So the dispute was not this that it will be void. The dispute is whether the arbitrator should impound it or like it should not be referred to the arbitration at all if their stamp duty is deficient. So the court opined no stamp duty has to be paid. One yeah, earlier, judges... earlier, mechanically, the courts and all were acting upon such clauses and appointing right. arbitrator. Now the courts have said no. Unless until it is properly stamped, it can't be acted upon. Yes, so the, the thing is, now the people will go to the adjudicating authority, get the stamp and use them. So that's how it will work now. Yeah. Now, the next section, which is important. So what happens if there is an arbitration agreement and parties still go to the court? So there is a clear cut bar on this kind of uh, approach in section 8. Section 8 of the Arbitration Act provides that if there is an arbitration agreement between the parties and the dispute is brought before the court, then it is the duty of the court to refer them to the arbitrator. So, as if there is any arbitration clause, one party files, despite the arbitration clause, files a suit before the civil court, then automatically the other party can take an objection that under the section 8, the matter should be referred to the arbitrator. Obviously, the question will come for the appointment and etc. But because of the section 8, those, those suits will not proceed. So this is the importance of the section 8. So a resolution professional should be aware of these things. If there are any such proceedings, then this plea can be taken. Another call the resolution professional is supposed to take after coming into call for the recovery, whether he should institute a suit or an arbitration, then they should check the clause. Because if they institute a suit, despite there being an arbitration agreement, the other party is likely to take objection under the section 8 and matter will be referred to the arbitration. Then the next section is section 9. Section 9 deals with the interim measures. So one of the reasons people want to go to the court saying that who will obey the order of the arbitrator and even before the arbitral tribunal can be constituted, the subject matter of the dispute can vanish. Like the people can sell away the property, dispose of the assets or whatever, maybe. So, there is a remedy provided under Section 9. Section 9 of the Arbitration Act says that even when there is an arbitration agreement between the parties, one of the party who has the apprehension that he can be adversely affected by the actions of the other, they can approach to the court and ask for any kind of interim injunction. So, in case of arbitration proceedings, there are not one, but there are two sections which deals with the interim measures. The first one is section 9. The section 9 deals with the powers of the court to grant injunction or interim measures. And there is another section, which is section 17, which we will come later on. So, whenever there is a necessity of having an urgent relief and you require an order of the court to protect the assets of the corporate data or somebody who is uh, going to run away with their own assets in order that the CD can't recover, then the first and foremost step for a resolution professional is to file an application under Section 9 for interim measures. Now, the next is Section 10 of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. 
So normally what happens is that the parties are free to determine the number of arbitral or arbitrary tri tribunal. It should be odd numbers. You, you cannot appoint the two arbitrator. The reason is simple. If one part says one and another says another, then what is the decision? So it has to be always three, five or something like that. And if the parties cannot agree on a mechanism or the mechanism is not provided in an agreement, then it will be a single arbitrator. That's what the section 10 is. Next section is one of the most used sections in arbitration proceedings. It is section 11. The importance of the section 11 is that at the time of the signing of the agreement, or after the dispute has arisen, the parties are not able to reach on a consensus that who should be the arbitrator. If the parties has provided a mechanism that there should be two, one is appointed by one, another is appointed by another, and there should be a third independent which be chosen by the two other one. Suppose those two people are not able to choose the uh, the chair of that arbitral tribunal or if there is a no if the notice has been given for arbitration and there is no reply from the other side for a long period of time say 30 days more than 30 days or he has already filed a suit and what is to be done or a section 9 application is filed but still then arbitrator, arbitrator is not being appointed in all those cases, there is a remedy available under section 11, where any party can approach to the court and say that we have a valid arbitration agreement between the parties and the matter should be referred to an arbitration. The high court or the Supreme Court, depending upon the nature of the dispute, find a suitable person and will appoint an arbitrator. In most of these cases, the retired judicial officials are normally appointed, but sometimes the other people are also appointed as an arbitrators, where like engineering, engineers, chartered accountants, etc., depending upon the subject matter of the case. But largely, though are those are the retired judges. And so far, whatever we have covered has to be borne in mind by the resolution professional while entering into the contract. Because in the IBC, the resolution professional has the power to enter into a contract and appoint multiple people to keep the company as a going concern. Meaning thereby, there are multiple people with whom the resolution professional is entering into agreement on the behalf of the corporate data. If an arbitration properly worded arbitration clause, which has the, all the, the circumstances which works in the favor of the corporate data is provided, then probably those disputes will not arise. And if arise can be decided in a short period of time. So those things has to be kept in mind while signing an agreement as a resolution professional as well. That will go a long way to make sure that the agreements are complied with. Now, the next important section is section, uh, section 11A is not that important like 11A and 12. 12 is the section to uh, grounds of challenge. So in between, there is one of the issue which comes in the mind of the arbitra uh, parties while entering into the arbitration. This question is the impartiality and the bias. The question which logically comes into the mind of the people that what if the other party approaches this gentleman or related to this gentleman is appointed an arbitrator, then obviously he is going to decide against me. These were the policy issues which arose time and again and was a significant roadblock in making the arbitration mechanism popular. So 
the government amended the arbitration act and inserted a schedule i think it's a fourth and uh, fourth schedule which provides a list that who cannot become an arbitrator suppose a person has taken 100 arbitrations of one party he obviously cannot become an arbitrator so the limit is around 3 a person who was a chartered accountant of one party cannot become an arbitrator an employee cannot become an arbitrator a director cannot or an ex director cannot become an arbitrator a husband or a wife cannot become an arbitrator so there is a yellow list and there is a red list if there is a doubt upon the impartiality of the person who is deciding then it can be challenged and section 12 provides that mechanism grounds of challenge so there are other sections in between if uh, uh, one of the things which is like if as a chartered accountant, as a cost accountant, as a company secretary, as an advocate, if any of you are thinking of uh, appointing someone, then one has to check that list of negatives which has been provided. Another thing is as soon as somebody is appointed, he has to give a declaration of independence kind of thing that he is not related to any of those parties. And that's how the legislature has tried to make sure that the mechanism remained transparent and unbiased. Another development which happened in the arbitration is the Supreme Court of India, in which Justice U. U. Lalit was the honorable judge, has decided that one party cannot retain the right of appointing the sole arbitrator. So what it means that assuming that there is, there, there is a like this kind of techniques has been used by MBFCs mostly or the recovery companies and sometimes the large industrial establishment against the employees. What they do, they draft a long agreement and at the bottom of it, there is a clause. This particular clause will say that I will have the, and sometimes in the government companies as well, that I will have the right to appoint the sole arbitrator which will decide the dispute between me and you. Now the law is well settled and very clear. All those clauses are illegal. So what is the consequence? The consequences is not that, that the arbitration agreement itself will become the void. The consequence is that only that part which gives the right to one party to appoint a sole arbitrator will become invalid. So the next logical step will be wherever there is such a clause where one party has retained that right, then it should go in section 11 and the court will appoint the arbitrator. So that's how the, the mechanism is working. The next sir, step, sir, the court appoints the sole arbitrator in that case also? Suppose yes. We take the yes, they will appoint the sole arbitrator. If the parties request, they can appoint the three as well. But what happens is that uh, with every arbitrator, your post increases. So there is a schedule four. The schedule four provides the model guideline for the cost. So if you have a one, if there is a stake of say like, like five, 10 lakhs of rupees, then having a three people arbitral tribunal will work against the parties because they have to pay the fees of three arbitrators plus their own lawyers. So in the small value dispute, the court normally prefers to appoint one, but the parties can always request for a three-member tribunal. There is no harm in it. Hope that answers your question. Yes. Sir. Thank you, sir. Now, the next important question which comes is said, who has the jurisdiction to decide whether a particular dispute is arbitrable or not? So lately, there has been tendencies among the parties to challenge 
in section 11 when the parties are going to the high court in section 11 to say that this dispute is not arbitrable at all and therefore it should not be referred to the arbitral tribunal this question the power to decide this question west with two bodies one high court and second arbitral tribunal but there is a slight distinction the distinction is this when an application is going before the court in section 11 the court will only scrutinize prima facie case it will not deep dive into the agreement and the communications between the parties to find out whether it should be referred or not. But if it has been referred, the parties can always take a plea in section 16 that the dispute is not arbitrable and that issue will be decided by the arbitral tribunal. The arbitral tribunal can arrive at either conclusion to say that the dispute is arbitrable or the dispute is not arbitrable. So section 16 gives power to the arbitral tribunal to say that they can decide the competence of the arbitral tribunal to rule in on its own jurisdiction to say that whether they have the power to decide the dispute or not. These kind of objection can be many ways. One can say that there is an allegation of fraud. One can say that the, the amount is less, the claim is more than the, what the arbitration agreement prescribes. The issue of the seat, there can be multiple issues. So all those complicated issues regarding the arbitrability of the dispute is decided by the arbitral tribunal itself in section 16. So that's how it works. Now, if you recollect, we have discussed section 9 in which the court had the power to give the interim measures. The same right, the exactly same right to give interim measures is given to the arbitral tribunal. Why this has been given? Suppose if the arbitral tribunal is toothless, if it does not have the power to give the interim measures, then the people will not use this mechanism at all. So in order to make sure that the arbitral tribunal can give the same relief as the court can give, there is a parallel section, which is section 17. So assuming somebody has taken a loan and that is the only asset of that person, and that is likely to run away from the company, then if an arbitrator has been appointed, he can say a pass an order to say that you protect this asset. Take that asset in the custody. Hand it over to this person. These kinds of direction can be passed. One of the best example is the Amazon dispute, Amazon and this Amazon dispute. In that case, the arbitral tribunal sitting in the Singapore passed an order injuncting the Indian party to do certain acts. So those kinds of the directions can be passed under section 17. There is a new term which is now being referred as emergency arbitration appointment. It is nothing but it is use of section 17 in an expeditious manner. That's how it works. I'll just take a small break, have uh, uh, drink some water and restart. Just give me two seconds. Sir, when will the role of orbital tribunal will come into picture? 
in this presentation or like I could not generally, understand. Generally. No, first appointment of arbitrator takes place. Mm -hmm. When the tribunal issue comes, when the when it reaches tribunal, when any dispute is there or uh, as because soon, court as is soon as, as soon as the person is appointed, he becomes the tribunal in section eleven. Okay. So okay. when we are reading section seventeen, it's the power of the tribunal. So he assumes the tribunal. So okay. the process okay. works like this. Uh, because this is a very important question and thanks for the question. Whatever happens is as soon as the court appoints or the party appoints an arbitrator, arbitrator, the arbitrator sends a communication to the parties that, okay, come for the first meeting where we will decide the procedure. The parties come, they say that we decide to follow this particular rule or the CPC or we don't want an oral hearing or whatever the procedure is. And then a certain timeline is fixed that one party is supposed to file the claim, counterclaim, etc., etc. So the section 16 and 17 comes after the tribunal assumes the charges. And tribunal assumes the charges immediately on appointment. As soon as they give the consent, as soon as they give the declaration under section 12 saying that I don't have a bias and I, I, I become I'm ready to become a tribunal. Hope that answers the question, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, this, sir, that means for each every contract and every dispute, there will be a, I mean, this will be termed as a uh, tribunal. Yes. Yes, sir. You okay. are absolutely right. And one more thing, sir. Uh, like, you know, so far as, uh, like, you know, taking reports or uh, just to safeguard my interest, uh, which one is uh, advisable to go to this uh, court or uh, using this power of uh, arbitrator under Section 17? Depends upon the facts of the case, uh, how soon you can get the arbitrator appointed. No, so then why that uh, for the same cause of action, two courts are being referred? Right. So suppose you file a section 11. That's a very great question. If you file a section 11 and the date is given after one month and suppose the underlying asset is something like fruits which will perish in two days, what will you do? <laughs> You don't allow that subject matter to manage. Na? So even before that 17 could come into play, you should go in section 9. The so section 9, the court will give you the relief. Or if there is already an institutional tribunal. Where so the, going to the court and taking data, they're also like, you know, uh, like, you know, the time is a major factor. No, normally it is given or, on the first date. Okay, okay. <laughs> Normally, it is given in the first and it will depend on the arbitration clause as well. So, in some of the arbitration clauses, they appoint the CA. No, sir, I'm talking about the court because you're not in the, the court is not in your hand. Like, you know, they've got their own procedure. Suppose I go to high court for taking some relief. So, the matter will come on the board and the trial will be heard and the any the interim uh, relief will be, could be granted. Matosav, it depends actually in which jurisdiction you are. So, uh, are you from Delhi? Yep. No, I am from Mumbai, sir. Okay, so in Mumbai, it's it's. It, I I think the listing takes a lot of time. So in Delhi, suppose if you file a matter and you clear the objection, the next day it is listed. Okay. Okay, so mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. So you have to consult that particular lawyer who is practicing in that court that how much time it will take, and accordingly you will take a decision. So the answer yes, will depend upon jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So in Delhi, normally it doesn't take much of the time. So we don't advise, we don't say that don't go to the court because court is easier. Then there is also a second factor. In some of the cases, there are institutional arbitration and they are even faster. They can appoint an arbitration even in the middle of the night. So if you go to the CIAC and there is some oil dispute, then they can appoint the arbitrator within a few hours and he will decide the section 17 application. So Facts and situation will guide your ultimate decision in this matter. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So the next section is 18. It's very simple that when you are going before a tribunal, you have to be treated equally. So there has to be equality of the treatment uh, of the parties. And this is one of the grounds of the challenge. Nothing beyond it. 19 is an important section. And it's important for the reason 
that it gives the autonomy to the parties to decide the rules of procedure. If a person is supposed to follow the same kind of rules and which is supposed to follow in the court, then there is no advantage of going to the arbitration. The purpose of arbitration is to make it cost effective, time bound and result oriented, whatever is outcome happens. So in order to ensure that you have to have a particular procedure which guides to these logical ends. So therefore, section 19 gives pure autonomy to the parties to decide what should be the procedure. In case the parties are not able to agree on the set of the procedure, then it is the tribunal which decides what should be the procedure. And the procedure depends upon the nature of disputes. So assuming that everything is documentary, and the parties have no dispute regarding the validity of the documents. In that case, the tribunal can decide that there is no need of oral evidences. So all those things are possible in an arbitration, which is otherwise very difficult to achieve in the uh, court proceedings. In court, always will go, it will follow entire procedure which has been laid down in the CPC. But in arbitration, there is a choice. And that's how the section 19 comes into the play. So time, bound here, sir, so time bound here means is there any time limit prescribed or for giving a decision? Right, sir. There is a time limit prescribed now post amendment and we will come to that section that is 29A. So we are in 19. In 10 sections, we are going to come to the answer to your question, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. So the next question is, uh, next slides is section 20. It's place of arbitration. So in arbitration, there are two things which one has to keep in mind. One is the venue, one is the seat. What is the difference between the two? The seat of the arbitration governs the procedure, rules of the procedure. But the venue could be anything. I'll give an example which makes the things more clear. Assuming that there is an agreement between a party which is like um, in India, another party is say in Dubai. They have an arbitration agreement. Or take an example within India. So one is in Bombay, another is in Chennai. The parties have decided that the seat of the arbitration is Delhi. Delhi Arbitration Center, whatever it is, and venue could be anything. So, irrespective of the fact that the different hearings of the tribunal is either taking virtually or they are happening in Goa or Singapore or anywhere else, the procedure which is governing that dispute will be of Delhi when the seat has been agreed. So, therefore, while drafting the arbitration clauses, or agreeing on arbitration clauses or proposing the arbitration clauses, one must keep that distinction in mind. It is always better to agree on a seat which gives the jurisdiction of, to that particular court to interfere in the proceeding. Suppose if you haven't determined the seat, then which court will issue the summons to the witness if witness has to be called? If the relief has to be taken in between section 9, then which court is to be of course? So, it is important for the parties to approach the arbitration agreement very seriously and define the seat of the arbitration. The next is 21, which deals with the commencement of the arbitration proceedings. So when the arbitration proceedings commenced for the sake of the calculation, as soon as the request for arbitration is made, so that's the statutory provision for the calculation of the timelines is section 21. And that, that also answers that question. When come the arbitration process starts? So for the calculation, it starts this. The tribunal assumes the charges as soon as it gives the consent. Next, statement of the claim and defense. So in any arbitration, 
there will be two parts. At least one party will make a claim and another party at least will say that he is not liable to pay or he will defend it. This is statement of claim and defense. So they are supposed to give the documents and access trust. So this is the rules of procedure which has been provided. It's a broad guidance. It doesn't uh, lay down the minute details how and how much is the time and access to access run. So when you are agreeing on an arbitration agreement and if you appoint an institution, then those minor gaps between the procedure will be filled up by the rules of the institution. So there is a there is a like a, there are multiple institutions which are working in Delhi or in India. Say almost every high court has an attached arbitration center, just like in Delhi, Delhi International Arbitration Center. Then uh, there are private arbitration centers as well, like the Mumbai International Arbitration Center. Then there is another one which is Nani Palkiwala Arbitration Center. So the broad rule of procedures or the mind which are given in the act are later on modif can be modified by the parties and the minute details are always provided in the rules. If the rules are not agreed, then the tribunal will decide. So that's section 23. So, so far, any doubts, any questions, anybody, any of you yeah. have? Sir, so far as the venue is concerned, so mm -hmm. venue is also pre-decided as uh, like, you know, the same. Venue can be decided and it can be changed frequently as well. With the consent of both the parties. With the consent of both the parties. Okay. So there are cases when like uh, each hearing is taking place in a different place. So that's a possibility and it can happen. But seat okay. once decided uh, cannot be changed. Seat once agreed between the parties, it cannot be changed because it gives jurisdiction to that particular court to make sure that the arbitration proceedings are going in accordance with law or different kind of application can be moved. So that's the importance of the seat. Okay. It cannot be changed. Yes, sir. So the... Uh, One more thing which is important here is to note that there are claims and there are counterclaims. Uh, the counterclaims are the claims by the defense. Assuming one party says that you haven't completed the work of construction, within one month and therefore I incurred the losses, he files an arbitration, he files his claim, the other party files a defense. But in the same arbitration, the other party who has executed the contract can say that you have asked me to do extra work and therefore I am entitled to this much of amount on account of that extra work. So that's Sec that second assertion to say that I'm entitled to that much of amount, you are not entitled, but I'm entitled to you, is in the form of counterclaim, which has to be responded by the first party. So the statement of claims will be filed by both the parties, as well as the statement of defense. It will have impact on many other things, like the fee of the arbitrator. The fee of the arbitrator will go significantly up because now he, what he will do to calculate the fee, he will add the claim as well as the counter claim and whatever is sum is derived, then he will apply the schedule four or whatever is agreed between the parties. And that's how the fee is calculated. So one must be really careful while filing the claim or counter claim that what would be the impact of filing the counterclaim on the overall uh, dispute. This is a very important consideration. So sometimes the people do not do take into account and arbitration goes into a geo per day. So Mr. that's the... Taking yes, a hypothetical uh, example, 
suppose I have uh, uh, supplied some goods or uh, rendered some services and I have not been paid up and there is arbitration clause. I have uh, like, you know, uh, enforced and like I've intimated uh, to, uh, to appointment of arbitrator and the matter to be decided by arbitrator. Suppose, as you said, like, you know, you have to, uh, like, you know, counterclaim. The party, suppose, uh, files a counterclaim. Yes. Counter counterclaim for the liquidated damages or something like, you know, just to, uh, I mean, delay the process. Though, no. actually, I'm, yeah, I'm the one, like, you know, who has rendered the services. But I have not been paid off rather than, like, you know, they are asking for the counter, uh, I mean, uh, damages. So, that used to be a case in the past in ad hoc arbitrations where the people could use the counterclaim to delay the decision. Since, as you inquired earlier, Mato Saab, you said that whether there is a timeline and I answered it, there is a timeline. So irrespective of the fact that whether it's a claim or a counterclaim or both of them, like uh, uh, whether he has filed or not counterclaim, the timeline doesn't go beyond what is prescribed. Therefore, it cannot be used as a mean to delay the arbitration proceedings. So, that, that caveat is there. The only negative impact it will happen that if somebody files a false counterclaim, then he is supposed to pay the arbitral fee in proportion to that amount. And in case that counterclaim fails, then that cost has to be borne entirely by the party who is filing the counterclaim. So there is a regime for the cost, there is a regime for the time, and that's how the arbitration can be used as a tool to make sure that the, the people complies to what they have agreed to. So there are three objectives of an arbitration. One, to control the cost, to make sure that the decision is impartial and it comes on a time. So, and the parties retain the full autonomy. It's confidential, like uh, uh, then, you can drive the process the way you have agreed. So these are the advantages of an arbitration over the litigation. If the parties use those options meticulously and after proper application of mind, it is always economical, less time consuming and beneficial for the parties than litigation. If the parties try to derail the process, it's not possible, but uh, it used to, you are absolutely right, this used to happen prior to the amendment within the 2015. Okay. So, uh, we are already on section 23. As soon as we come on 29A, we will get those answers. Okay, sir. Now, hearings and the... <clears throat> so, 24 is elaboration on 23. There could be a possibility of the oral hearing. The parties have to be given the reasonable notice of the hearings if they are going to take place. The parties can submit the written statement. So it's almost like a court, but in more expeditious and the friendly way. So this is also the part of the process. This is important. Because, so why the, why the concept of this oral hearing like you know, came into picture? What was the logic and rationale behind this? Uh... So there are the, like this question. Thanks for that question. This question is really important. It goes into the root of the, the matter. So as an arbitrator, uh, take an example. The arbitrator is a judicial person. Okay. If you have given him an argument of say 100 or 200 pages and the other party is also given the argument and if there is nobody to explain and it has not been properly explained in the writing, then how do you ensure that the judge understood that particular argument? So oral hearing is a discussion which makes it convenient for the judges 
and ensures to the parties that the person who is deciding the dispute has actually understood the dispute. So multiple times you must have seen when the two people are arguing, they are arguing on a completely different aspects. It and needs to be recorded, sir. The oral oral argument needs to be recorded. It is not required to be recorded, but with consent of the parties, it can be recorded. So there are numerous institutions, private companies, which are providing these services where they sit in the arbitration and they record it. So, so I was, uh, if you see the proceedings of the CAC, I have seen multiple, mother, like multiple of them. So what happens is there are dedicated professionals who sit in the arbitration proceedings and they reach and they record each and every word. Suppose somebody has smiled, there is ha 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 or something like that. Everything is meticulously recorded and tabulated at the end of the proceedings. And it is given as a form as the book compilation forms. And the parties can use that thing if somebody is challenging it in the in one of the cases, the one of the party got the relief that this particular point was not argued, still decided by the arbitral tribunal. So this can be done only when you have recording of the proceedings. Secondly, many of these arbitrations are taking place online. There are now nowadays even they are videographing the proceedings as well. So it depends upon the what the parties have agreed and what they want to achieve with those recordings, how much confidentiality they want to do. So if the parties agree, yes, answer is yes, it can be recorded. So the next section is 25, default of a party. So obviously what happens if somebody does not appear, then it can proceed. Like the ex party hearings are possible. That's section 25. Section 26 is uh, another important section which is like the expert appointed by the tribunal. So, uh, reading the section will not help. So, I will give you a simple example. Assuming that an there is a dispute on oil and gas between the two parties. And there are many technical issues that how much drilling should be done, how deep it should go, how hard was the rock whether there was any geological surprises, what was the heat, whether the diamonds were, the diamonds which are cutting the rock was of sufficient, like particular quality or not, whether any, any subsidiary minerals was dis, uh, discovered or not, what was the quantity of the total mineral discovery. So all those technical issues may not be the expertise of the tribunal. The tribunal may not know answer to all those questions. In order to get those answers, the tribunals can ask the parties to bring their own expert or itself appoint an expert to find an answer to that question. So that power to appoint an expert has been given in 26. Nowadays, there, has, uh, there, is a, there is a system where the, even the parties are bringing in the experts to determine or quantify the damages. So suppose because of one party, the production of a factory could not commence, then what would be the damages? Normally in a court, it goes by the random rule. The court says that like X amount or go, there are no rhyme or reason given. But in arbitration proceedings, actually there are experts who calculate the damages, they run the Excel sheet, say that this much be the production, this could be the supply, this could be the expected output and there how they calculate the damages. So different kinds of experts are appointed by the parties uh, on the, if the tribunal asks so, or the tribunals to get to the core issue and decide the questions. So that's the power given in 26. So who has the power to restore the ex parte decision? Uh, I haven't understood the question. Could you, Mr. Mato, could you repeat? Uh, who has the power to restore the uh, ex parte decision? In the earlier slide, you said that uh, 
uh, their ex parte decision is possible? Yes. So to answer that, there are two stages. If the arbitration proceedings are still going ahead, the arbitrator has the power. If the arbitration has concluded, then it, it like the party has to take its uh, chance in section 34 challenging the arbitral award. Oh, that is considered as an award, ex parte decision. Yes. So what happens is that uh, there are this this ex parte award is pretty common in the non-banking uh, NBFC cases. So somebody has taken a loan to open a rickshaw or a, whatever it may be or a vehicle to run in the Ola cabs, etc. And the people has vanished away with the cab and he is not responding. In all those cases uh, where another party did not turn up, then the tribunal decide those dispute ex parte. And those awards are also binding. Because the tribunal cannot say that uh, the tribunal should not be left without doing anything. In order to make it binding, it's the, the person must appear. Otherwise, what is the sanctity of the procedure? Yes. The losing party will never appear. So therefore, the power has been given to the tribunal that if somebody is not appearing, it can still proceed. So there could be some genuine reason also, sir. Bearing, bearing it could, a, it could. It could be. There could be genuine reason. Then, there, therefore, there is a possibility of challenging that award in Section 34. Okay. And there are, in many cases, there are genuine reasons. This is in my making by the panel of arbitrators. So sometimes what happens, there is, there is a panel of arbitration. Then it has to be taken by majority, majority of the arbitrator tribunals. So in one particular instance, what has happened is that there was a three-member arbitral tribunal. One, tri one person has decided in the favor of one party, another person has decided in the favor of another party, and the empire has decided to say that one half our judgment of one arbitrator is correct and half judgment of another arbitrator is correct. That was a, one of the weirdest situation I have seen so far. So in those cases, it's very clear, whenever there is an arbitral panel or a panel of an arbitrator, it has to be decided by the majority. It cannot be by one person. So there are only three of them. So majority could be, you say that uh, bearing the umpire, the third of third person. So there, how, to, how, how to achieve this majority in this case? So the, in that case, it was set aside. The award was set aside because all, there were not one award, so there now, were three awards. Now, no longer it's uh, umpire, but it's presiding arbitrator. Uh, sorry, sir, I, I, I could not hear it. Could you repeat, please? So now it is, you know, presiding arbitrator, not the empire. Yes. Empire was the earlier term. So now it is presiding arbitrator, the third arbitrator. Yes, you can say like uh, that, that observation is correct. In some jurisdiction, it is still called empire. In some jurisdiction, it is the uh, presiding arbitration. So arbitration is universal and the term has been used in different manner in different jurisdictions. So then, then the answer of Mr. Mehta's question, what is the time limit within which a dispute is supposed to be decided? So the ideal time limit of an arbitral award to be decided is 12 months, which can be extended by the parties by further six months. And beyond that, they have to take permission of the court. So that's the timeline which has come in 29A. So now it is not possible for a party to drag the arbitration proceedings for two years, three years, five years, which used to be case prior to this amendment. When this amendment came, sir? 29 years? It's 2000, 2015, I think. I'll just okay. check the date and confirm. Because the okay. <laughs> so the 29A makes the objective of the arbitration possible that there is a strict timeline which is to be followed between the parties. And it is not, it is very difficult in most of the Indian courts that you can get a decision within one year. 
But now if you go to the Delhi High Court Arbitration Center, yeah, MCIA, 90, more than 90% of the disputes are decided within a period of one year. And this one year period is from the completion of pleadings, which means claim, counter claim or a statement of defense, etc. Right, so sir. basically this one year excludes that time which two parties to take to file their claim and counter claim. Right, sir. Absolutely right, sir. So in, in, in effect, it goes beyond one year, if you see hmm. that, because parties take time sometimes to complete their pleadings. So the pleadings have to That's be completed within six months. Within six because months, the pleadings have to be completed. Yeah, it's it one year. In one of the cases, I have noticed that parties take took time. One, 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 they kept on extending it, but uh, it went beyond one year. I mean. So that observation is valid, and there is a reason for the change of the policy. Earlier, there was this completion of pleading was not there. So the people were not able to complete the complicated arbitrations within the period of one year because yes. the pleadings runs into 20,000, 30,000 pages. Yes, and also expert evidence. Is a expert evidence and access trust. So therefore, they have to change the policy and bring back this amendment that only the period for the arbitrator starts to run only after the main rules of the game have been fixed. Yeah, after the pleadings have been completed. Right. So that's how the, the, the this change came into place and that's how it's working. So your observation is correct. The people take a lot of time to complete the pleadings. But it cannot be endless because in subsequent, when we see the regime of the cost, if by the reason of one party deliberately delays, then it can be figured out in the cost as well. So we will come to those sections and you will notice that. So how it could be controlled. Okay. Then one of the most important section which could be used by the resolution professionals is 29B. The 29B allows the parties to agree on the fast track procedures. In this the timeline is of six months and the oral hearing takes place only if required. So typically the CIRP proceedings doesn't last long and therefore if there are contracts in between the resolution professional can insert that particular clause in those agreements. I'm, am I audible? Yes. Hello. Yeah, because I, I, everybody vanished from the screen. Yes, sir. So audible. Okay, thank you. At least a couple of people should keep their camera switched on. <laughs> so I, I, I get the feeling that I'm still interacting with humans. <laughs> and you still get the feeling that I'm not an artificial intelligence. No, no, no you, you are, are audible, audible, audible. Very much audible. <laughs> the moment you get up. You are Thank natural you. Intelligence, sir. So the, the 29B is a fast track procedure. How it could be used? So suppose there are small amount of contracts. Suppose it is a telecom company. Suppose it is a consumer goods company. Suppose if it is an FMCG, there are many small, small contracts, number of contracts. If in those contracts, if the parties decides to have a section 29B, then the dispute will be decided within a period of six months. So those provisions could be used by the resolution professionals. There is one more thing which I wish to point out here, and it is important for the resolution professional, is that there are many contracts where there is no arbitration clause. And the resolution professional is unable to realize the value of the assets under those contracts because of the disputes or the parties are not simply responding. If this is the situation, the resolution professional might try or may try to convince those parties to agree on arbitration clause. If this could be done, then those 
disputes could be decided within the CIRP period, at least in the six months, hardly any CIRP is over, but those disputes will be decided and the value could be realized. Sir, who will enter the agreement in that case? Because the corporate uh, directors are suspended. They don't have power. It is a resolution pro professional who will enter into a contract with... Uh... Right, sir. So the power has been given in the IBC. I think it's section 25. Let me check. It's section 25, which allows the resolution professional to uh, let me open just section 25. Uh, I'll, I'll just stop this share here and I'll just open the IBC and the relevant provision. Just a second. Uh, so the section 20, there are like uh, section, uh, save, open. Just a second. What's the question, Mr. Mato? So, but like, you know, uh, in absence of like, uh, like what he discussed about uh, that, suppose in absence of any specific, uh, uh, I mean, arbitration clause in that agreement, uh, mm. then how, like, you know, the NARP could, like, in order, in order to, I mean, SPD, I mean, go for a expedious uh, resolution, because if you're going for a I mean, civil court, and that might be costly and the time consuming. So, like, you know, uh, Garpi can enter into a contract for arbit initiation of arbitration with, uh, with the consent of other party. Uh, yeah, only with the consent of the other party. But the question yes. would be other party, whether he will agree or not. That's Sir, he has to, because he has to go for a resolution. No, no, or he, it, it's, it's not a mandatory thing that he will yes. agree. It's, it, it will be basically with the consent of the other side. For example, they, suppose there is a vendor and uh, there is a corporate data and there is a vendor and they know there is an agreement for supply of goods, etc. And there is no arbitration clause in that. The vendor may not uh, like to enter into arbitration clause because there are alternative remedies under Commercial Courts Act 2016, which is also quite expeditious. Yeah, he was he was talking about like you know just to initiate like thanks, just taking the try. Thanks for the input, sir. So the commercial code still works very slow because of the large amount of pendency, at least in uh, North India for sure. It doesn't get decided within the time. But limit. no, but but Mr. Paliwal, now there is a timeline which has which has to be followed, and Delhi High Court in several cases has not allowed. Uh, statement of uh, WS to be filed beyond the period which is prescribed under the commercial code. Yes, so the timeline is I'll, not I'll tell you that the, the, the period is 120 days. Yeah. So 120 one days is like three uh, How many? Four, four months. months. Four, four months. months has already gone when only what you got is the written statement. Yeah, and, WS. Thereafter, and thereafter, the evidence, the evidence will another take at least two to three years in Delhi High Court. Like no, but that. for that also, there is a timeline. Because here, in arbitration also, after completion of pleadings, you get one year. So suppose that, that there also, you it's uh, two years. But uh, in arbitration, in uh, commercial courts, uh, now I, in one of the cases, we found it quite expeditious. That's why I was suggesting. Okay, maybe, maybe. Like I have been doing many cases, but I found that, that there is a date of four months. And with no, in fact, in one case, the court didn't allow us to file the, our WS because we we thought it's a normal CPC <laughs> where you can file. I mean, get, so now they are not allowing even filing of WS. Your defense goes, and it is decided on the basis of the plaint. So that's a very, I mean, that's what what we found. Anyway, please continue. Okay, so uh, coming back to that discussion. So 25D, I think. No, no, <clears throat> that is for accountants and yeah, it says that 25 to B, if you see. In the duty oh, of 25 to B, yes, yes, right. 25 to B 
okay. it says that he can represent that exercise, exercise rights for the benefit of corporate data in judicial and quasi judicial legal proceeding arbitration proceedings arbitration. okay so he has the power to do so and there is one more section i'll, I'll just point out in some second yeah it's it's like any other power because while uh, exercising his jurisdiction or power he has to enter into contracts etc so anyway even if it, if it uh, the other side agrees he can sign an arbitration agreement and agree for arbitration proceedings thank you sir for that observation now i reshare the screen uh, presentation just a second Good. Okay. So, uh, could you see the presentation again, sir? Yes, yes. Okay. Thirty is the settlement. So there is a there is a typical feature which is available in the court proceedings as well in an arbitration. That during the arbitration, the parties can enter into a settlement. If the parties this enters into a settlement during the arbitration proceedings, then the arbitrator can pass an award based on that settlement. This situation arises in many cases for the reason that after the claims and counterclaims and the documents are submitted. The parties realize their weakness and the strengths. Once those strengths and weakness are realized, they feel it better to get it settled rather than to wait for an uncertain future because they are not able to uh, get a favorable outcome or etc. This is how it works. So settlement is proceeded and this settlement will be binding between the parties. The next section is the forms and uh, it should be writing, it should be signed by the parties, it should be reasoned. So there are many parameters on which an award should be, uh, and the award should meet those parameters to sustain the challenge under section 34. So those have been given in 31. 31 deals with the regime of the cost. So what happens is that it, under this section, the arbitral tribunal has the power to determine the cost. The cost has to be determined by taking into consideration various factors. So I'll just like to uh, open the Arbitration Act and I'll show you what are those factors. I think I was not able to capture all those factors in this thing. So I'll just open the Arbitration Act. So I'm sharing another screen of mine just to share. So this is an arbitration act and the relevant section is, this was the question by someone, I think Mr. Mato earlier that what will happen to the cost? So if somebody delays in filing the pleadings and that is concern raised by uh, another learner person, so the regime of the cost. This is very important. And that is one of the key detriment if somebody tries to delay the proceeding. In relation to any arbitration proceedings or proceedings under any provision of this act pertaining to arbitration for anything contained in the CPC shall have the discretion to determine whether costs are payable by one party to another. So always the cost follows the vic victor. So the, if the party has won the arbitration, it is entitled to the cost from the other party. That's the normal principle. The amount of such cost and when such costs are to be paid. 
In international arbitrations, normally you have two awards. One is the main and subsequently to the cost. In India, many awards, there is a less discussion about the cost. But now the trend is changing because the people are filing the application under Section 31A to claim the cost. And what those costs are? The fee and expenses of the arbitrators, courts and witnesses. Legal fee and expenses. Any administration fee of the institution supervising the arbitration. Any other expenses incurred in connection with the arbitral or court proceedings and this award. If the court or arbitral tribunal decides to make an order as to the payment of the cost, a general rule is that unsuccessful party shall be ordered to pay the cost to the successful party. So filing false claim will have a negative impact. The court or arbitral tribunal may make a different order for the reasons to be recorded in the writing. So there could be a second award after the main award dealing with the cost only. And the most important thing which comes here in determining the cost, the court or arbitral tribunal shall have regard to all the circumstances which are those. And this will cover the concern of most of the parties. The conduct of the parties, whether a party has succeeded partly in the case, whether the party has made frivolous counterclaim leading to delay in disposal of arbitral proceedings. This specifically covers the question raised. Whether any reasonable offer to settle the dispute is made by a party and refused by the other party. So in case, in one of the cases, when an arbitration proceeding started, immediately one of the parties says that we are ready to pay the entire amount since the damages etc. Ultimately, only the award was of the amount. No damages was made payable. Then the burden of the cost of the arbitration may fall on the person who continued with the arbitration despite being a reasonable settlement offer. So that's important, section 30, as well as this court. Then the court or arbitral tribunal may make any order under this section, including the order that a party shall be a, a proportion of another party's cost, a stated amount in respect of another party's cost, cost from until and exit. Now, so there is a detailed guideline provided in the Arbitration Act to make sure that the parties are not allowed to delay the process in order to achieve something which they are otherwise not entitled to. So delay tactics may work against the party if this particular application is being made and decided fairly. Sir, another party here means uh, the complainant? It could be both. And it's for one, it's another party. No, so, the, the, I'll, the I'll how it works. party. Yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll explain how it works. Assuming the complainant won, then the another party is the yes. defendant. If the that defendant is. won, then the another party is the complainant. So that's why they deliberately use another party. So whoever wins mm -hmm. or whoever loses, the other person is the other party, depending upon the facts of the case. So I'll stop share and come back to my slides again. Just a second. So, so this was the regime of the cost, and that is one of the one of the most significant amendment which has been brought in. One is twenty nine A, which fixed the timeline. Twenty nine B, fast track, and thirty one A, which is the regime for the cost to reduce the delay, and apart from that, 
that section 11A or the impartiality declaration which has been provided. So those are the fundamental changes brought in by the legislature in the arbitration. So it is no longer the same process where the years have been taken to decide a particular dispute and sometimes the cost of the arbitration is more than the value of the dispute itself. Now it can be easily tackled. Uh, yes. So the next is 34. 34 is the application for setting aside the award. So there are jurisdiction in the world where you can't challenge the award itself. Typical example is Belgium, where you can't ch challenge the arbitration award itself. There are jurisdictions where the challenge lies to the Supreme Court only, like Switzerland. If there is an international arbitration award, you want to challenge it, it directly goes to the Swiss Supreme Court. There are jurisdictions where there are dedicated courts to challenge it which is like Singapore, the court, the, there is a commercial court in the Singapore where the dedicated jurisdiction has been provided where the arbitration can be challenged. India follows a different approach where the 34 has been given. So typically section 11 goes only in the high court, but the 34 will go according to the pecuniary jurisdiction of the respective court. <coughs> So if the so typically say the award is less, award is say 50 lakhs, 60 lakhs, 70 lakhs, in Delhi it will go to the district court. In Delhi, there is an original jurisdiction in the high court. But we take the neighboring state Haryana or any other state where the high court does not have the original jurisdiction, irrespective of the quantum of the award, it will always go in the district court, the 34. Now, the 34 lays down the basic principle on which the award can be challenged. The award can be challenged on the ground that the, there is a lack of jurisdiction. In one of the LIC case, the LIC says only the arbitration arb arbitral tribunal can only decide when the jurisdiction is beyond 50, 50 lakhs, etc. So the court held that it, was, it did not have the jurisdiction. There is a procedural irregularity. The, there was an ex parte order and thereafter the party came, says that he's listened to me, listen to me, but the arbitral tribunal says that we will not listen to you. So there is no follow-up of the natural justice. The judge was clearly biased or related to someone. Or apparently it is contrary to the public policy, etc. So these are many of the grounds on which it could be challenged. So 34 is the right to challenge the award. It doesn't like. So one question may come to the mind. If there is a challenge provided, if the person is supposed to come to the court again, then why not in the first instant he should go to the court? Why to go to the arbitration and pay money to the arbitrators? At least in the court, the judges are for free after payment of the court fee. So the answer of that question lies in the, the availability of the grounds on which you can challenge the award. In a court, in a commercial court or in a normal court, if you file a suit, then you can challenge it on the grounds of fact, on law, and the first appeal is almost matter of right. It is a matter of right. It is a continuation of suit. After the first appeal, one can file a second appeal on the question of law. The second appeal normally comes to the, it comes to the high court only. And post second appeal, someone can go to the SLP, etc. So the, the one, the number of stages available in the suit is more compared to the arbitration, because here it is 34 and that's it. That's the end of the matter. Second, the grounds which are available to challenge the award is significantly less in section 34 compared to a normal decree or a suit. 
And that is another advantage one must bear in mind while agreeing to an arbitration. That's a win-win situation because it puts a full stop on the litigation at some point of time. It gives the finality. So that's the reason the 34 is important. Sir, could you just uh, give some example about the public interest, as you mentioned? Right. Actually, there is a judgment by Justice Ramanna in the Supreme Court, which gives the detailed list of the arbitrability. Or there are there are multiple judgments, not one. Actually, there are many. So, <clears throat> somebody take a typical example. If an arbitrator has gone into the jurisdiction of a criminal court, saying that there is a fraud and etc. and etc. Or it has decided a dispute which is like, suppose there is a dispute between the two criminals to share the, the loot. So like that's an extreme example, but that might happen. Somebody has done the corruption and say that whatever we will win from this corruption, uh, we will decide it by way of arbitration because it cannot go to the court and arbitrator has decided the dispute. So there could be multiple instances Earlier, the public policy used to be a very loose term where the courts were interfering in the award on any ground, saying that this interest awarded by the arbitral tribunal is exorbitant, say 18% is exorbitant, it should be 8%. There were multiple reasons by which the courts were, or say that, that, uh, uh, that particular procedure which should have been followed under the CPC, the same analogous procedure has not been adopted, etc. So in order to answer that question, I'll stop the share the screen and I'll show you the actual provisions where it has been restricted. That, give, that will give you a fair idea. So just a second. In fact, in one of the recent judgments, the Supreme Court has said if, if the arbitrator does not follow the agreement, the provisions of the agreement, that is also against public policy. Right, sir. That, that's there. Just a second, let me come to... If, if the arbitrator decides against the provisions of the underlying commercial agreement, then also that is against public policy. Yes, yes sir. Just a second. Actually, they have defined the public policy now. So I'll just opening the particular section and then I'll share. Corruption and all those things are covered. Uh, so uh, this is explanation one to section thirty four. Uh, just a second, share the screen. Let's go to share. Okay, so this is section 34. You could see it? Yes. So 30, yes. 34, uh, and let's read the grounds so you it will become clear. The arbitral award may be set aside by the court only if a party was under some incapacity, like the arbitration started in America against a person for a dispute of rupees two lakhs. He could not even appear, and then there an award came. That happens in many cases. Or it was seriously ill, or whatever may be, some kind of incapacity. The arbitration, arbitration agreement is not valid under the law to which the parties have subjected it to. Maybe some narcotics or something else. The party making the application was not given proper notice, not followed the natural, only email was sent and the party has discontinued that email. The arbitral award deals with a dispute not contemplated by or not falling within the terms of the submission. Say the arbitration will respect to only the quality of the construction, but the dispute is regarding the, the interest on the... Uh, escalation cost. So if somebody has restricted that particular clause, it goes beyond it. The composition of the arbitral tribunal procedure was not in accordance with the agreement between the parties. Uh, B, the court finds that the subject matter of dispute is not capable of settlement of arbitration under timing in force and the arbitral award, the last B is important, 
that says the arbitral award is in conflict with the public policy of India. So public policy used to be interpreted very loosely. In order to avoid that situation, the legislature has inserted the explanation one. For avoidance of any doubt, it is clarified that an award is in conflict with the public policy of India only if, and the next is important, the making of the award was induced or affected by the fraud or corruption or was in violation of section 75 or 81. So if there is a fraud, if there is a bribery, this came because of, uh, if if you people recollect, there was an antrix called company and they obtained an award by fraud. That's an allegation. And because of that particular instances, this, uh, this was inserted. It is in contravention of the fundamental policy of the Indian law or it is in conflict with the most basic notion of the morality or the justice. So there could be further conflict, the further confusion. So there is an explanation too. For avoidance of the dust, either there is a contravention with the fundamental policy of Indian law shall not entail a review on the merits of the dispute. So the court cannot say that the merits is here and there and therefore they can interfere with the award. Uh, an arbitral award arising out of the arbitrations other than the international commercial arbitration may also be set aside by the court. If the court finds that the award is vitiated by the patent illegality appearing on the face of the award, provided that an award shall not be set aside merely on the ground of erroneous application of law or by reappreciation of the evidence. So mere some fault of the law or different interpretation can be achieved on the evidence by the judge or the arbitrator, the award cannot be set aside. Meaning thereby, the grounds on which an award can be challenged is seriously limited in comparison to what you can achieve in a civil suit, be it a commercial, be it a normal. And that's what the distinction is. And that's how this section is important because normally almost there is a tendency to challenge almost every award. And now there was there is one more judgment since like um, the, this in this uh, in this meeting like we have many knowledgeable people so they might be knowing there is a judgment of the Supreme Court which says that the award can be set aside only in entirety it cannot be set aside in part. There is a further development that only if their part is separable then that can be set aside but the remaining award is intact. So throughout the jurisprudence there is a effort by the judiciary and the legislature to give more sanctity to the process adopted by the parties in the arbitration. And that, that, what, that is what it reflects in all these things. I'll stop share this section 34 and come back to the slides. Just a second. So we have reached 34. 35, finality of the arbitration award, it is binding between the parties, nothing significant here. 36, enforcement, in enforcement again there could be a challenge but those grounds are very limited. Again, I think this is a very important section because it goes into almost every arbitration. So there are three, sec three four sections which are really important that, that like those are you can say that the the heart and soul of the Arbitration Act is 9, 11, 17, 6, 16, 17, and this 34 and 36. So I think it's important to look at what is the provisions in section 36. I'll come to 36 and uh, I'll share the screen again. So this is... Uh, enforcement. So where the time for making an application to set up, set aside the award, under the award has expired, then subject to the provisions of such 
such award shall be enforced in accordance with the CPC in the same manner if it were a decree of a court. So award has the same tech, same legal same legal value as the decree of the court. So there is no distinction between the two. Second, where an application to set aside an arbitral award has been filed in court under section 34 for filing such an application shall not by itself render that award unenforceable. So unless there is a stay, the execution proceeding still continues. So this is in distinction to the provision which was earlier. Earlier, the award was not given that much of sanctity and mere filing of the challenge under to the award entitled a party not to enforce it. Now it has changed. Now, unless the court grants an order of stay or operation of the arbit said arbitral award in accordance with the provisions of subsection 3 on a separate application made for that purposes, execution still lies. Upon filing an application under subsection 2 for stay of the operation of arbitral award, the court may, subject to such conditions as may deem fit, grant stay of the operation of such award for reasons to be recorded in writing. So there has to be reasons if the court wants to stay and the next few provisions are more relevant. Upon filing an application under subsection 2 for stay of the operation of arbitral award, the court may, subject to such conditions as it may deem fit, grant stay of the operation of such award for the reasons to be recorded in the writing provided that court shall while considering the application for grant of stay in the case of an arbitral award for payment of money, have due regard to the provisions of grant of stay of a money decree under the provisions of the CPC. Money decree, there is in the provision of the CPC, court can direct the payment of the amount or deposit in provided further that where the court is satisfied that prima facie case is made out that the arbitral agreement or a contract which is the basis of the award, the making of the award was induced or affected by fraud or coercion, it still stayed the award. So in case of money degree, there is a different, otherwise there, there has to be a compulsory stay if there is a fraud. And there should not be a stay if there, it's a, like a money degree, unless there is some payment to be made in accordance with the provisions of the CPC. So for the removal of doubt, it is hereby qualified. It's, uh, it's not that important. So what 37 is also important. So I'll just read the 37. What orders are appealable? If you read the list of the appellate or appealable orders under the civil procedure code, then you will find a long list which the appeal can be filed. But in arbitration proceedings, only three orders, like three, four things, three things actually, where there is an appealable orders. And then for, there are further appeal only in two things. What are those? Refusing the refer the parties to the arbitration under section eight. That's an appealable order. Granting or refusing to grant any measure under section nine, the state. Eight deals with if there is an arbitration agreement, the court must refer the parties to the arbitration. That's eight. Nine refers to the stay if there is a need to preserve the asset or whatever it may be. The court has the power to grant interim injection or similar orders. So if it has been granted or refused to be granted, there is an appeal provided. Setting aside or refusing to set aside the arbitral award under section 34. So section 34's appeal is this thing. Appeal shall also lie to a court from the other arbitral tribunals accepting the plea referred under 2.3 of the section 16. 16 is regarding the power of the arbitral tribunal to decide on its own jurisdiction. And B is section 17. 17 is the power of the arbitral tribunal to grant the stay. So except for these situations, so 3 makes it clear. No second appeal shall lie from an order passed by the appeal under this section, but nothing in this section affects takeaway rights to appeal to the Supreme Court. So the appeal has been specifically barred under section 37. 
And that's why the arbitration should be a preferred mode if you want to reduce or put an end to the litigations. That's more effective than the normal court proceedings. So coming back to the presentation again, I'll share it. Okay, so uh, we have almost covered two hours and that's the remaining one hour. So far, if anyone has any questions, I assume that all of people you have understood everything or I'm not a good speaker, be that as it may. Uh, feel free to ask questions, whatever you have. And thanks for the input of the various... Uh... Sir, there is one question. Please, sir, please go ahead. Yeah, if this moratorium is on under IBC, under section 14, mm. uh, whether the arbitration proceedings will continue? It has an answer, yes, and it has an answer, no. Yes, it cannot, no, it cannot continue against the corporate data. Yes, it can continue when the arbitration proceedings have been initiated by the corporate data for recovery. Okay, so... The I have I have exactly in the letter, I, I thought that question will come. So I clarified it earlier and I have specifically quoted those judgments in the subsequent slides. So I'll, 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 I'll refer to those judgments where the court has held that the section 14 moratorium applies or stays the proceedings against the corporate data. So that's why again, it becomes the Arbitration Act relevant for the resolution professional because if in the books there are people from which the corporate debtor is supposed to make recovery and there are arbitration agreement in these contracts or subsequently those parties agree to the arbitration agreement, those proceedings can always be initiated or continued by the resolution professional. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, that means for recovery, you can use the arbitration mechanism. Right. Uh, if any proceedings against you are going on, you can take the shelter under IBC. Wow. Yes. But Manish, sir, arbitration proceedings are between two parties. It is not for or against any party. Arbitration means to something the claim of one and other to be dealt with. Sometimes you have filed for the recovery arbitration, what you are saying for recovery, and you have the counter claim, the use counter claim, which is coming back to you. Then so, so, so in that case, the claim will continue and the counterclaim will stop. So that is, I'm saying so, because arbitration proceeding is nothing, just it has to be initiated, but there is some dispute, then that's why there is an arbitration. So no proceeding can be initiated. Yes, the RPs are taking advantage that I do not want to pursue this arbitration proceedings pending before that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would take the advantage of section 14, but that is just to shadow it that no proceeding can be continued against me. And what will be the fallout, sir, if the arbitration proceeding has come out some claim against the company, whether that will during the CIRP or during the liquidation period, what would be the uh, uh, treatment of that, whether it will have priority or it will be dealt with in accordance with other mechanisms? So, uh, Vinit ji. Uh, this 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 long question of yours has multiple parts. Yes, I'll answer. I'll break it one by one and answer it. So it will be uh, easy to digest and may easy to explain. So let's take the first situation. When the arbitration is filed against the corporate debtor by some third party, when you assume the charge as a resolution professional or an IRP or a liquidator that will be automatically covered by the moratorium and they will come to a standstill first. Second, there are proceedings which are initiated by the corporate debtor. There is no counterclaim and CIRP proceedings are initiated. Those proceedings will not stay. They will continue. The RP will pursue them. Two, Third RP, situation. RP has to pursue that or RP can deny that I will not pursue even if it has been filed by the CD before the initiation of CIRP or he has to continue this. That is a question, sir. He has to continue it because... Means if you... He cannot take the shadow of section 14. 
No, because if you section 14 has to be read with section 25. Okay. The majority of the cases, the proceedings even filed by the corporate debtors has been put to hold by the various high courts because of section 14. Many, many orders are there. I'll come to those orders. I have specifically, I have kept in mind that this question will come of yours. I knew that somebody or at least I'm happy that you have pointed out that question. So I'll cite specifically those judgments and I'm telling you conclusion in advance. We will read the language of those judgments, but I'm telling the conclusion in advance. It is the stay will be only against when the proceedings are against the corporate data. If the corporate debtor has initiated the proceedings, there will not be any stay. Third situation, we have covered already two. The third situation where there is a claim by the corporate debtor and there is a counterclaim by the another person. In that case, the claim will continue and the counterclaim will stop. Or there is a claim by some third person and a counterclaim by the corporate debtor. The counterclaims can continue. Then there is a, again, there is a, there is a uh, uh, kind of thing between the, uh, there is, there is a, another facet of the thing. So I think few slides down the line, I have quoted the judgment of Delhi High Court and the particular language, which will clarify that doubt. There is so, one judgment where it says that both claim and counterclaim can continue and if there is a counterclaim against the CD, that recovery can't take place because of moratorium. Absolutely, sir. I was on the same point. That recovery has to be dealt because with. They say the that, okay, both can continue arbitration proceeding can yes. continue, although it's, it is leading to a very strange situation. Both can continue, but ultimately, if there is a recovery proceeding against the corporate debtor, then that will be uh, barred by section 14 a uh, moratorium no no sir that will automatically will become part of the claim na sir it has been adjudicated then uh, adjudic it's, even if but uh, yes. after that there will be recovery proceeding execution proceeding the, uh, there can't see, be any recovery proceeding in crp and liquidation sir there has to no, be no no i am what, what i am saying is arbitration proceeding suppose there is an award against the corporate debtor for that you will go for in execution proceedings and that will be barred under 14 because yes. moratorium is there because there is one of the judgment I read somewhere. Which yeah. is, this is fine, sir. In Atul that Ji, situation, sir, you are absolutely right. Claim, That's why Justice Pratibha Maninder Singh, Delhi High Court. Yeah, yeah Pratibha Maninder Singh, yes. Because right, yes. See, it says that okay, arbitration proceedings can continue, but yes. after, suppose that there is a uh, counterclaim which has been uh, uh, accepted in the award against the CD, and then there is an execution proceeding, then that, that execution proceeding will be uh, not allowed under 14. Moratorium. See, sir, what is the difficulty? If we have this kind of the award on table during CIRP, that has been put to hold because of section 14 moratorium. Either the company but, but, got a regulation. But suppose, but suppose, take a reverse case. Suppose that you have won a case against a, a creditor or something. Then, because of value maximization concept, you can uh, execute. Sir, because execute the moratorium is available to me, not to yeah, other parties. Yeah, that will. But but on the other side, the the creditor or the other side won't have that option under sec because of section fourteen. Yeah, okay. please continue. Uh, we are just discussing yeah, in sorry, between. Sorry, sir, to disturb you. <laughs> No, it, it, it is all right. It's all uh, it's all knowledge sharing. So yeah, we are trying to make it more interactive. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. So one of and the so even in the case of liquidation, like uh, section uh, fifty three four, uh, the moratorium is not in place. So and, that, uh, like, you know, <laughs> that was so the like, point, you know, sir. I was saying where well, absolutely yeah, yeah, I could, I could. <laughs> that if we have this kind of the award, either this award has to be dealt with by the resolution applicant, otherwise where he will go. Or if the company goes to the liquidation, there is no moratorium. He will come to enforce this. Who, who will be the owner, process owner? That is it is point. ultimately a resolution applicant. If so that is, is the like... difficulty, sir. Any yes. award coming in mid of the CIRP, then it has to be dealt with in the CIRP to my understanding in the form of claim itself. Unless until it is again appealed and the outcome is coming after the process is over. 
So Vinici, like you, you, what you have said is absolutely right. Okay. So irrespective whether it is an award or it is a decree. Yes. To be dealt in the claim. So assuming that somebody have won an award of rupees 10 crores and the resolution plan is only of 5 crores. Correct. Obviously, the when the resolution applicant is giving the plan, he will figure out and he will reduce the value yes. which is payable to this award winner in proportion to his claim. Like suppose if he is paying only 30% to OCs, so he will reduce the amount to OCs. Yes. Okay, so that's how it is to be dealt. Yes. Even in the liquidation, in between an award comes, which is against the corporate debtor. In all those examples, we are dealing with a situation when the award has come against the corporate debtor. Okay. There is a positive situation where the, the award is in the favor of the corporate debtor as well, or it is pending in the litigation. So we will deal with that situation as well. So if in the liquidation it has come, still the waterfall mechanism has to be followed. What will happen by virtue of an award? So why this award is going on and what is the implication? It will make the life of the resolution professional easier because it will put finality to the claim. Correct. So recently there is a judgment by Justice Bhushan in sitting in NCLAT where one of the resolution professional has done a really smart thing. There was a claim of an X amount, which was like say few crores of rupees. Then during those proceedings, the award came, which was like uh, less than the claim amount. So he modified the claim according to award. This was brought in challenge before the NCLAT and NCLAT has upheld the action of the resolution professional. Come, so, come again, sir. Uh, what was the crux of that uh, case? The crux, I, I'll explain the situation again, sir. So in this case, I, I don't know the figure, so I'm referring the figure of yes. 100. Okay. So what has happened that somebody filed a claim of 100 rupees and the arbitration was pending. Mm -hmm. During the CIRP, the award came for whatever reason. When the award came, the award was only for rupees 10. So the resolution professional has changed the claim from 100 to 10. Okay. So this action of the resolution professional was challenged on the ground that the resolution professional is not an adjudicating authority and I have challenged the award. So he has wrongly done something. He should not have changed my claim. So NCLAT held that the action of the resolution professional is in accordance with law and since the award has come, he has rightly changed the claim from 100 to 10. But sir, in CIRP, how after the 90 days, resolution professional can amend the list of the creditor at his own? He cannot take, unless until somebody file a claim against you, you cannot uh, verify and admit that claim. So award holder has to file his claim and then you have to admit that. That is no, a, sir, it was, it was a different case. There was a so there scenario. can be a different case, sir. There can be a different yeah. case. Maybe within 90 days, somebody has come. It is possible. Because after 90 days, if we are continued to amend the list at our own, it will not be possible anymore. Sir, he would have treated as a contingent liability while accepting the claim because that has not reached the finality, which I, uh, I presume. Yes, but because award is there, na, sir, I'm saying that award is there. So when award, award is there, you accept the award. You accept the award. You accept the award. You accept that must have been under verification. But to hota hai ek dost ke liye hamesa hi ten time hota hai na. Actually the amount against award to hamesa hi utna aata hai. Ab claim apne kitna bhi kar diya utna award to kabhi bhi nahi aata na. Nahi, wohi to dost aaya to dost usne accept kar liya. Ha, thik na usne accept kar liya, but the contention is different, sir. Maybe uh, the person is not happy, or the party in whose favor the award has been given is not happy with the amount of 10 rupees. Maybe they are looking for 20. That's why they are preferred appeal with the high court. Right? So the contention is that unless until I reached my claim finality and filed, how could you admit it to 10 rupees? So if there is an appeal within the time frame, again, it will become contingent claim, na, sir? 
I think I, I think we, we, we are going in a nice nitty gritty, which is important. I think we will, I, I, um, you just drop a message to me after that, I will share that case flow. So that will become clear. Fine. No, no, it's fine, sir. It's uh, good. I'll, I'll give my... So I there know, are so I'll many things me. even the RPs are learning, na, sir. Sometimes they are appreciating <laughs> something and they are putting the questions. How can you do it? So depends, sir. How it is moved in the court some point of time. There is no, nothing said pattern of it. Yes, absolutely correct. Sir. And sir, yes. uh, how how this case would be like, you know, suppose there is no resolution plan and the company has gone into liquidation and that award is pending. Because once the liquidation order is passed, like, you know, I become the uh, ex officio. And in the meantime, dissolution application has been filed. So the liquidator will disperse the amount as per section 53. Sir, I am not no seeing it is coming after that. Sir, this is contingent by the time because it has not been adjudicating. His question is that arbitration proceedings are pending. Then this is contingent, sir. See, uh, all of you are assuming one factor which is not always correct that the award is going to come against the CD. Okay. Let's take a situation. I, I'll break it down the preposition. The uh, award proceedings were the, 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 the proceedings were pending when the liquidation order was passed. After the liquidation order is passed, fresh claims are invited. In the fresh claim, even when the fresh claims are invited, if the by that time the award has come, then automatically it will figure out in the fresh claim. Assuming it has not decided by that time claim came. It has come just before the disbursement under section 53. Then also the, the amount will be reduced of that award. The claim will become, the 53 claim will become the amount awarded and it will be reduced according to its seniority. No, 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 sir. Unless until the award has come before finalizing the list of the uh, stakeholders in liquidation, the claim amount cannot be admitted and, and something which cannot be admitted cannot become the part of section 53. Section 53 only dealt with what, what you have admitted. The question is what to admit and how to admit. So that's where the, you have to see the distinction between the role of resolution professional and the liquidator. Okay. Assuming that award has not come till that uh, you have finalized the list of the creditors. Mm -hmm. Because liquidator is a quasi-judicial authority, okay? He has the right to decide the claims unlike the resolution professional. So if the if you have already decided, then that party has to go before the NCLT. But humbly, it is very difficult. When somebody is already sitting on the adjudication before the tribunal, liquidator probably would not like to take a call to go and decide it and forget about the tribunal. He has to wait for the outcome. Either he has to continue with the arbitration proceedings because moratorium is not there and then contest it or leave the uh, leave to contest it and withdraw it and say whatever may be the claim I'm admitting before the tribunal itself not at his own I, I I think we may differ in the opinions okay but the crux Don't think so, sir. Uh, but something which is on the uh, before the tribunal can be adjudicated by the liquidator sir this is something very different preposition. The thing is, uh, the law is still unsettled. I think I haven't yeah. come across where both the things have been done. So there might be people who can take one view or there might be people who can take another view. Be that as it may, suppose the arbitration proceedings, like you are supposed to conclude the, your liquidation proceedings within a time frame, and arbitration doesn't come to an end. So you can't say that I will not quantify the claim. That's my opinion. You, you are can't. wrong, sir. You can't do anything. You have to submit before the tribunal that I have my limitation. You pass the award, whatever the data you have today. That 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 something becomes factual. As a matter of principle, there is a the liquidator cannot say that I will not do my duty because there is something else which is pending. Anyway, let's leave it that there might be a case, something where the court will give clarity in the future. Be that as it may. Uh, Let's come to the other side of the thing, which is important for the resolution professionals and the liquidator. I'll share again the screen. This is, uh, so section 39, lay on the arbitration award and deposit to the cost. 
you have to pay the arbitration fee. There could be two consequences. One, the arbit if you don't pay, the arbitrator can refuse to adjudicate the claim or he can refuse to release the award, the lien on the award. So those two proceedings have been given just like uh, in the CIRP, the, uh, the CIRP cost has been given the precedence. So similarly, it has given the arbitral cost precedence in the act. Now, the another facet which we ignore normally as a as a as a as a professionals is when the corporate debtor is supposed to recover something and there are arbitration proceedings and those arbitration proceedings does not attain the finality then you have to refer to i think uh, 31a of the liquidation regulations assignment of not readily realizable assets any court proceedings or any recovery proceedings or even in the arbitrations where the corporate debtor is supposed to recover the amount or it has a claim against the other parties, those becomes not readily realizable assets and they have to be dealt in the liquidation in accordance with these rules. And if the amount is significant, there will be people who are ready to buy those claims. The, the, the term not readily realizable assets encompasses actionable claim. And these things what? are actionable claims in the nature of forms in transport. Well, sir, SFA, secure, I mean, the securities financial assets. That is one of the category. It can be any other thing as well. So okay. actionable claim is a much wider term than that uh, secured thing. So actionable encompasses anything where you have a right to recover, which could be assigned. You can sell it and that has become a new industry. There is a litigation funding. There are assignment of the suits, et cetera, decrees, et cetera. That all comes under section 31A. So, so suppose this doesn't happen, like in the liquidator couldn't come and sell uh, or I mean, assign uh, the assets under section 37A of the IBC. Then uh, can I take that, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, plea and file my dissolution application, making this as a, uh, I mean, like, you know, we can make a prayer to the NCLT, Honorable AA, to, I mean, forego the claim? So, so the, the, there was, there were multiple opinions. There were people who were making the forego application. But that approach is incorrect to my understanding because now, if these assets are not sold, it goes to the creditors. There is a specific provisions. If we see the liquidation regulations, I'll just come to it. Uh, uh, just a second. Let me open the liquidation regulations. Uh, legal framework, regulations, and... So these are the liquidation regulations. And just a second. Um, so can you see the liquidation regulations, sir? Yes. Uh, yes. Very much. So let, let me come to 37A. 37. Assignment of not readily realizable assets. It says that a liquidator may assign or transfer not readily realizable assets through a transparent process in consultation with stakeholders committee in accordance with the a consideration to any person who is eligible to submit a resolution plan for the insolvency resolution of a, so, uh, distribution of unsold assets. Okay. Sir, are you there? Yes. So the read thirty. Uh, if I re, if I read thirty one a, the liquidator may, with the permission of the adjudicating authority, distribute amongst the shareholder an asset that could not be sold, assigned, or transferred due to its peculiar nature or other special circumstances. Yes, so you, you, you don't forego it, you give it to the stakeholders. 
and you seek the permission of the NCLT, and that's how the process will work. Before, before, before this amendment, which came, uh, the people used to say that we will make an application for Orgo, and those applications were allowed. But after 13th November 2020, this is the procedure one should adopt. Okay. Even sir, suppose that uh, I have a financial creditor uh, being a bank, and I want to, I mean, assign these those these assets to one of the stakeholder being that financial creditor. And they are normally what happens in practicality. They they normally they don't I mean, uh, take care of uh, this kind of situation. They, are, they they say that I don't have that kind of uh, uh, what do you call uh, infra to take that asset and recover. I think I think the normally this is the problem which is happening because people are not advise, advertising them properly. Uh, otherwise, there are plenty of people who are ready to buy those things. Many of times I have seen then there, there, there is an application under section 19 and there are application under 44 and 66. And those are like forensic auditor report without any basis, nothing underlying and the amount shown are carouts and they are trying to sell it. But if there is something real, I'm sure that there are people in the market who are ready to buy them. But in case nobody is ready to buy, then it's the financial creditor. If they don't have the resources, then it's the luck of the people. What can you do? If you want to make the money, then you have to make an effort. That's so simple as a professional and as a banker. And suppose I, in my process, suppose I don't have a, a, I mean, the financial creditor, it is only operational creditor. I have, so, I, I, in, one of, in one of the cases I was dealing, the operational creditor bought those assets. Okay. And it was, it was purchased for a handsome price, 50 lakhs. Mm -hmm. So, sometimes. So, that means the, the underlying principle is that, okay, you have to take that recourse under regulation 37A. If you cannot sell that uh, by way of expression of interest, that then those assets must pass on to uh, the stakeholder. Right, sir. 31A. That's a specific law now. There is no guessing. So that means I have to apply to AA for uh, uh, distribution of this unsold assets under regulation 38. Right, sir. Now the regulation is there, so you have to apply it accordingly. Okay. Okay, sir. So, uh, then what is an actionable claim? It has been defined under the TP Act. It's a very large subject, but it encompasses very all these issues, including <laughs> uh, we are like running neck to neck, so I'll not devote much of time on this. So first and the foremost thing, what we have learned so far. So an RP should do a due diligence of all the contracts and find out arbitration clauses. One. If possible, he should make an endeavor to people to agree to those clauses and initiate those proceedings. That way he can maximize the value of the corporate data. And that will ensure that in case those proceedings doesn't attain finality, they can at least be transferred as a not readily realizable assets. So taking recourse to the arbitration which also encompasses to some extent mediation will in overall increase the liquidity in the corporate data. <clears throat> so that's one of the first thing. Then the next things, like it gives the transparency, it post saving protection of the corporate data assets and etc. which is any case the people are doing. Another thing the arbitration arbitrator should do, they should include, <coughs> resolution professionals should include arbitration clauses which are properly drafted in their all their contracts. <coughs> so this is one of the case. So there like multiple questions came on this issue. Can arbitration be initiated on mere filing of the section seven proceeding? Mere filing of the proceedings under Section 7 of the IBC cannot be treated as an embargo on the court exercise of jurisdiction of 11. Unless it is admitted, the arbitration can still be initiated. So this is one of the first judgments. I will be sharing those slides so you can use those judgments. Fresh arbitration proceedings post-declaration of moratorium. So this is another judgment, KSOL. 
versus State Trade Corporation of India. Arbitral proceedings pending at the date of commencement of the CIRP cannot proceed during the moratorium. Fresh, I think there is something, the title is wrong. <laughs> I'll correct that and I'll send you the fresh judgment. Can arbitration proceedings initiated post declaration of moratorium period? So this alchemist associated moratorium expressly interdicts the institution or continuation of any proceedings against the corporate debtor. It was also observed that an arbitration instituted after declaration of the moratorium is known as in the law. So it cannot go ahead. This is another judgment on this issue. Then effect of moratorium on application for setting aside an arbitration award. Section 14 of the code would not apply to the proceedings which are in the benefit of the corporate data. So then there is a change in the pro change in the perspective. So they said that the 14, if it is in the favor of the corporate debtor, it will not be applicable. Can CIRP be initiated for hiding away from the arbitral tribunal? No. I have seen in a few days back, I was discussing a thing that the company has only one asset that was an arbitration where the recovery of the crores were pending and they were not able to pay even the arbitral fee. So they were contemplating going into the NCLT. So that was the dilemma, but that's the thing. The NCLT took note that an arbitral award along with the payment of interest had been passed in favor of the personal guarantor. He had always read it while executing the same. Relying on the Vidarbha judgment, NCLT observed that it was not an obligatory for the NCLT to initiate insolvency proceedings. Also, that's a little bit different point. So some of those headings are not up to the mark. I will correct them or you can ask, you can really ask, I'll forward those judgment. Could the creditors initiate proceedings under the IVC during the pendency of the setting aside of the proceedings of the arbitral award? <coughs> um, so this is another judgment of 2017, but the one which I wanted to really show is I forgot to include it. So where you can initiate, there are multiple institutions, there is institutional arbitration. <clears throat> Advantage of the institutional arbitration, reputation, effective. So institutional arbitration is always better than ad hoc in many of the cases, except when the amount of, like even for the small amount, there are dedicated institutions nowadays. There are institutions in India who are doing the arbitration for amount as low as, as, low as 2,500 or something like that. So there are multiple avenues available. Sir, what do you mean by ad hoc? Ad hoc arbitration? Could you just explain? Ad hoc arbitration is when the parties do not agree on a particular institution, but merely have a clause that if there is a dispute, the parties will go to the arbitration. In that case, the court appoints the arbitrator or the parties, there is another type where the parties agree, don't agree on an institution and say that we will appoint an arbitrator and they appoint it. It's called ad hoc because the arrangement is made as per the situation like that. Most of the companies or the uh, people will who have the like decent experience in this field will prefer an institution because institutionalization means standardization and standardization gives a better result. So what happens is that suppose if you take an example, you adopt Delhi High Court Arbitration Center, if you put in the clause, if there is a dispute by and parties, it will be governed by the rules by the DIAC, so and so. In that case, the DIAC will ensure that the fee is paid. There is a strict timeline for completion of the pleading in the DIAC rules. If those not followed, then there is a provision for the penalty. Even the arbitrators will behave in a particular fashion that if I, if I follow all the rules and I, they have more chances of getting an arbitration or something. So the standardization is always better than ad hocism. And that's why uh, most of the people will go rather for a standardized thing than an ad hoc thing. So these are the two types. Hope the distinction is clear to you. Yes, sir. Okay. So ad hoc arbitration. So this... Okay, so you ask, then the answer is there. There is a proper definition. Non-institutional arbitration can be defined as a procedure for arbitration. So that everything which is a non-institutional is regarded as ad hoc in simple terms. But in a 
formal language, I have put a slide on that. <laughs> uh, so, disadvantage of the ad hoc arbitration, selection of the arbit lack of expertise, failure to cooperate, the tribunal secretary, low value arbitrations. Low value arbitration is quite common in India. There are widely used, there are a couple of centers who have made really big this thing. One is Sama. One is CADR, and there are a few more which are emerging. They do like arbitrations for the telecom companies and as well as uh, for uh, non-banking uh, NBFC. So what they do, they send the notice in mass, like thousands of notice in a day. Sir, could you repeat the name? One is SAMA, S-A-M-A, I think. You can find their website. Another is CADR, C-A-D-R-E or something. And there are more. So you find the online arbitration centers in India and you will find the entire list on the Google. Okay. <clears throat> so they do really low value arbitrations and there are more. Like, And everybody has their own advantages or disadvantages. Even if there is no arbitration, there is no arbitration clause, they will send the notice for the mediation and arbitration and some people will agree and they will able to recover some amount out of it. So they are pretty expert in all those things. And in fact, you can have somebody who, to choose the right one and the drive the process. Sir, the reconciliation uh, conciliation should precede the arbitration? It's not mandatory, but it can be built into the arbitration. So there are two types of arbitration clauses. One is multi-tiered and one is the simple one. In simple one, there is no step prior to the arbitration. There is a multi-tier arbitration clause in which like you will find in all the government contracts where first, there is a there is a mandatory mechanism for conciliation, then dispute resolution board, and when it doesn't reach its finality in dispute resolution board, then it comes to the arbitration. So those are called multi-tier arbitration clauses. So they come in all form and sizes, in all, and most of them have a mediation which precedes the arbitration in those things. There is another thing which is happening right now is that. The government is in the process of uh, 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 finalizing a bill or uh, putting a bill into the parliament on the mediation where the mediation will become compulsory in all types of litigation, pre as well as post. And even without the consent of the parties, the court can refer the parties to the mediation. So that's in the pipeline. So, but uh, Mr. Parival, in this under the Commercial Courts Act 16, uh, now the Supreme Court has held that in Pali automation that uh, mediation has to be there before uh, this, this uh, institution of proceeding under Commercial Courts Act. Yes, you are absolutely right. That observation is correct. So the Commercial Court Act is limited to the certain types of the matters. Now the bill which is being proposed, which will be applicable to all types of matters, whether they are commercial. Yeah, because under commercial now it is mandatory now under 412a i think yes it is mandatory and you can subvert that process by filing an application for injunction because if you file an injunction that even without mediation you can go to the courts so there is a there is a way around it as well but even but now what 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 my entire endeavor is to to uh, to support that argument that the government is more placing emphasis on the mediation. So commercial court is the first one where the mediation was, first it was introduced in the CPC, then it was made mandatory in the commercial court. Now a bill is coming in which all types of litigation mediation will become mandatory. Hope that answers your question, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. So then high value arbitration, of course, there are many facets of it and there are a few more slides. I think mediation in insolvency matters is common. They are here, they are coming in the form of prepackaged one. So it's only an alteration or a different version of the same thing. Uh, mediation as an ADR and effective mediation, I'm referring only for one reason. Since the topic only relates to the arbitration, but both mediation and arbitration forms part of an ADR, alternative dispute resolution. And even in Arbitration Act 1996, there is a complete new chapter, complete chapter on conciliation. 
conciliation is also like mediation and there also the which the decision which has been agreed between the parties or the consensus between the parties achieves the status of the degree of the court and it is a step further that cannot be even challenged so even the arbitration there is a proceeding possibility to challenge but in mediation it is not so with that i think i'll stop my presentation and open the floor for questions so we have pretty 20 minutes and i'm meeting my timelines as well sir the mediation uh, relates to uh, commercial court act right uh, so uh, yeah what about what about conciliation this refers to so there is a there is there, there is a very uh, you can say that slight difference between the conciliation and the mediation. The difference is only on practical aspect, there is hardly any difference. One is a structured process and one is non-structured process. Because it is more confusing, like you know, using the word, I mean the same meaning interchangeably without any having vast variance in the definition itself. The reason I, the word is used. I'll tell you because as of today, there the mediation has not been provided as a standard process in the law, except in the commercial courts. So the mediation is referred in a loose sense somewhere in the CPC. For the first time, it is coming in a structured way in the commercial court, but there is not complete process. Complete process is only given for the conciliation in 1996 Arbitration Act. Okay, so the, as of today, the people who want to do the mediation, actually they go for the conciliation. The word is used is conciliation. After the new law comes, it will be mediation for everything. That conciliation thing will go away. But you are absolutely right. There is hardly any difference on the practical aspect between the mediation and conciliation. It's only uh, academic in nature. And now most okay. of the courts have mediation cell. Even Delhi High Court and District Courts, Supreme Every Court. court. Every, Every court, court has a mediation yeah. cell. If the parties agree, then they are more than keen to refer the parties to the mediation cell. I'm also, I'm also for all kinds of matters, matrimonial or commercial or anything. You are absolutely right, sir. I'm also a mediator in the Supreme Court. Yeah, there is a training. Yeah. So every court has, there is a committee which has been constituted by the Supreme Court. They provide a structured training to the professionals who, to become a mediator. And then these mediators are impaneled across the country. And the success rate is around 24% at the lowest and highest is around 29 or 30%. So in the so mediation, yeah. these decisions are... Is there any qualification to become a mediator? No. Different, like right now, as per the Supreme Court rules, it's a 48 hours training given by the, uh, the, the, the mediation. There is a committee which gives a 48 hours training. That is the only qualification you need to require. That is the only qualification. You need to be a lawyer also. So that <laughs> they can they will recommend your name for undergoing training. Otherwise, yeah. they will not. Yes, that that that's how it is working so far in the Supreme Court. So what is the what is the you know uh, uh, system for training uh, you know for the arbitrators? Is there any particular institution or uh, the court uh, has some you know uh, institute for training the arbitrators? So there, there Training is... Training to become the arbitrators, rather. So there, there are three facts which has to be kept in mind. The Arbitration Act so far does not provide any qualification. You can appoint anybody as an arbitrator, one. Two, there is an act which has a provision to prescribe the qualification in India for the arbitrations which has been passed and notified, but the rules are yet to come. It's called... India International Arbitration Center Act. It is located in the Vasant Kunj, New Delhi. Uh, it is headed by Justice Hemant Gupta. This is work in progress. The law. What has is that? What is that? Sorry, what is that? It's called the 
earlier it used to be called Delhi International Arbitration Center. Now it, it New Delhi International Arbitration Center. Uh, if you if you put the new International Arbitration Center and Hemant Gupta, you will immediately get the answer in the Google, the, their website and everything. So they have they have they have the right to prescribe the qualification, and there is an impanelment thing which is available on their website. And also the uh, third, sir, third is, is, let, is, let me complete your answer, the first question's answer. So one, no qualification so far. Second, this has come in and this is work in progress. Third, there is an international body which is called Chartered Institute of Arbitrators located in uh, Mumbai. London. Mumbai? London. London. London, okay. London. And it has branches all over the world. Uh, I'm at I'm also a fellow there and they provide a structured training to become an arbitrator. It's a, it's a really good one, really costly one. And the people... Have there is Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Right. So they have the branch in India also or uh, it's... Right. They have a branch in India and the office is in Bombay. And uh, I in think... Delhi also they have an office. I think uh, advocate, senior advocate Ratan Singh, I think, is heading there. Ratan Singh is a member of that executive committee office is in Mumbai. Yeah. So that do they conduct what a is the process for also? getting membership fellowship from this? Uh, if I can ask Mr. Paliwal. Uh, you go to their website, there is a structured program where you can start from the associate, then member. There is a module one, module two, module three. First, you become associate member, then you become member, then you become a fellow, and ultimate goal is the chartered arbitrator. There is only one or two in India so far, I think. Uh, that's it. Oh. So, Delhi one is New Delhi International Arbitration Center. Uh, New Delhi International Arbitration Center, sir, you are absolutely right. Any other questions, sir? I think there sir, are. Sir, sir, Civil Procedure Act is not applicable for. I think there is some exemption. No? CPC is not applicable in arbitration matters. It is only rules, you know, like different, different Singapore arbitration center has rules, uh, UN central rules. Similarly, in Delhi also or in India also, there are rules uh, which are to be followed. Uh, yes, you can can choose any of them. You are absolutely right. You can choose any of those rules and accordingly the process will be driven. Sir, calling witness eminence from a civil procedure or? Uh, Mahato uh, taking, taking, taking witness on record. Is it is emanated from a civil procedure or it is embedded in a, a arbitration act? There is a specific section in the Arbitration Act, and if somebody doesn't come, then you can always seek the assistance of the court. The court will issue summons, so the people will appear before the tribunal. But sir, summon is a part and parcel of civil procedure. So there is an application which you are supposed to make in the Arbitration Act to the court to say that these people are not coming despite giving notices, so the court will force them to appear before the arbitral tribunal. Because the arbitrator himself cannot direct the people. Na? So there is a procedure prescribed. If the if the notice is issued and they come voluntarily or by uh, if one of the party is able to bring them, then you can take evidence. But what if to the people who doesn't want to come? Then obviously you have to approach the court. See, sir, at the one end, like you know, we are saying that okay, there are exemption and civil procedure court is not applicable for arbitration matters. But we are taking the help of some of the how you interpret it. So the, the, the realm is like, this question has two separate parts. One, whether the CPC is applicable. CPC is very wide. It starts from the pleading, substitution of the parties, various applications. It's, it's, a, it's, it's hundreds of the page document. Calling witness is only one section. And that particular section, like, like that section, you can make an application under the Arbitration Act and call the witness. As such, the CPC is not applicable, but ultimately the court has to come in to say then force a person to appear before the tribunal. That is done through court by taking help of Arbitration Act. Sir, 
yes sir now it is clear so, i was the impression that yeah yeah mr anil does the, does, does the arbitration cell in the court do they help and support uh, you know for the uh, initiation of the arbitration process to the parties uh, if they want to approach yes if you uh, if you insert that clause in the agreement arbitration clause is there in the agreement uh, already no whether there is a clause which says that the delhi high court arbitration center or a particular court arbitration center is the the authority to govern the arbitration if no but if there is, is there, no clause if there is no clause then then you have to go in section 11 and request the judge to refer to the center okay so we have to go to the court specifically for this yes you you will go you will file an application under section 11 and request the presiding judge that refer my matter to the center and the center will help everything like they will appoint the arbitrators and the processor will go according to the rules of center okay so th that is the arbitration center in the court right okay thank you thank you sir any other question from the floor because i could not see anything in the chat i think we have covered most of the questions and most of the people are silent so they have understood hey, hey, you know in case of neutrality it's always uh, you know good to go through the court ah uh, you I may so, like if you if you choose the right arbitrators it is uh, always good the, the, no but for impar impartiality purposes i mean uh, the court's intervention is i think better that that's a matter of perspective because there are different centers like fiki also has their center then there is a there is a center for your stock exchange disputes as well so there are multiple centers and most of them are working fairly so, they have the panel of arbitrators i think yes they all of them have the panel of arbitrators except mcia which takes ad hoc decision like they appoint arbitrator on the spot like wherever whatever they yes. better to approach them yeah. it's always better to approach an institution like they are better than any other thing thank you thank you thank you anil ji for questions and thank you mahato ji for very actively participating in the discussions thank you sir oh uh, so shall we end the session sir Uh, if there is no more question, it's fine. I yes. guess. Mani sir, please share your PPT uh, with Anika. Uh, with the manager. Yes, sure. So I am putting my number on the chat box, and then my mail ID on the chat box, and then I will. You can mention your contact details on the PPT as well. I think. Okay, I'll put in the PPT as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so Mehta sir, would you like to offer a vote of thanks for sir? Hello, come again, please. So, would you would you like to do some vote of thanks for sir? Like, yes, yes, like, yes. Why not? Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, honor Mr. Manish yes, on behalf yes. of uh, Institute of uh, Company Secretaries. I mean, ICSI Institute, IPA, and it was really very. I mean, uh, very, uh, very like you know, we have been enlightened very much, and all the doubts were clear. in a very precise manner and uh, we look forward to i mean see mr manish uh, again and again thank you very much for your thank you very much sir very... thank you sir thank you for sparing your valuable time with all of us have a good day thank you thank, thank you, you. Have a small point I yes. wanted the phone number of Mr. Pawan because Thank the you. invoice I am having a problem because of the. I'll share, sir. I'll share. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. मैडम अटेंडेंस सर्टिफिकेट्स योर कंफर्म ही ना पार्टन सर अटेंडेंस सर्टिफिकेट्स योर चेंजिंग ना 
confirmation some confirmation mail up for that will be sent sir that will be sent on monday don't worry okay thank you thank you thank you